Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. This is the Lumberjack Landlord. I'd say hour, but we all know it's going a lot longer than an hour. So welcome to the show. I'm super excited to have you guys here today. As you guys know, your questions, my answers for usually about three hours. So we'll typically go till at least 2.30 Eastern time. We'll probably go a little bit. Might go shorter today. I don't know. Uh, it really depends on questions and not... Uh, if we have questions about what they are. <laughs> so, all right, we got lots of stuff to talk about, lots and lots and lots of stuff. There was a fun day with the three amigos on the live stream on Thanksgiving. I trust you guys all had great Thanksgivings. I know we did. Um, and yes, we still watch this stuff. Uh, I still watch a lot of other content um, just because I'm always learning. Um, even with as many units as I have, I'm still always learning. So super excited to have a bunch of folks here. We're just going to give it a few minutes, let people roll in, um, <clears throat> before we really kind of jump into things, but, um, real brief update on Eliana on my daughter, um, who is battling cancer right now. She's doing great. Things are going well. Um, she is, we just finished a ton of the aggressive treatments which are really tough because they're tough on her. They're tough really kind of on everybody because they're five days long. And so she's in the hospital for a five day stay and then she finally comes home and then she's usually home for just a few days and then she's back in. So um, we just finished that big long stretch. So it was awesome to have the whole family around for Thanksgiving and be able to spend good family quality time together. Um, we had a lot of PJ days because we're still quarantined. Um, so we had a lot of PJ days. We're just kind of hanging out and, and, uh, <clears throat> slowing our role. And as you guys know, I also have a nine to five job. And so, um, or not a nine to five job. I have a W2 job is probably the better way of calling it. Cause that's a lot more than nine to five. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, so good update on Eliana. Eliana is going in for more treatment. Um, uh, this actually tomorrow. Wow. Yeah. Monday's here that fast. So she's going back into for more treatment tomorrow. Um, but she is doing well. Um, thankfully with chemo and going through that experience, kind of your hope is for progress and she certainly is getting that. So we're super excited. Um, <clears throat> but, um, but yeah, lots of fun stuff coming. Um, so yeah, the, the three amigos, uh, Thanksgiving, uh, live cast was a lot of fun. We did that on, uh, the lumberjacks channel, my channel. Uh, is where we did it. <clears throat> um, I screwed up the tech. Um, well, I at least got the tech further than the other two would have. <laughs> so, so we at least got that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I made a couple mistakes. So the good news is, is I've since been able to remedy those mistakes. I've got a couple other things that uh, will be ready for the next live stream. When we do the next live stream, we won't have the delay. We won't have the weird funkiness to the beginning of that one that there was, which was which made for horrible television. Uh, but anyway, nonetheless, it was fun. We were excited to give back. Kind of, we had been back and forth with each other about let's do something cool and fun uh, for Thanksgiving, um, and we were all up for it, which was cool. You know, Dion being up for it and Mike being up for it too. Uh, so it was a lot of fun uh, to do it with those guys and spend uh, spend Thanksgiving with you guys. Um, and with, and with my guys too. So it was a lot of fun to do that. Um, handling a lot of questions. Um, honestly, I don't know anywhere else on the internet where you can get, um, three views on the same thing. That's as educated of, uh, responses as you're getting, because all three of us are investors. All three of us invest differently. Um, there is some overlap, obviously, between us because we are all our investors in real estate. Um, however, I know that all of our games have gotten better um, because of, of listening to each other and working with each other. Um, and so it's been awesome because obviously we're, you know, I'm over, I'm 3,000 miles away from Mike and probably about the same from Dion. And then they're probably, you know, almost a thousand miles apart themselves. So it's just a blast working with those guys still just grateful for them um, being uh, being around and, and having the opportunity to work with, with Dion and with Mike is just a blast. So um, all right. So we've got, <clears throat> got about 15 people or so in the live stream. Um, things we're going to talk about today is obviously first and foremost, what's most important is your guys' questions. Um, what you're experiencing, what you're going through, where you are in deals, 
talking about those deals. We're certainly going to spend time, um, spend time on that stuff. So, you know, that's important to me. Um, that's why I'm here. That's why I make myself available for three hours. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> getting that dialogue going in the group, um, share with you guys some local, it, it won't be a huge impact to you, but generally speaking, it, it will give you at least like a point of reference, um, is, uh, housing numbers. Um, what we're talking about housing numbers, I'm talking about what local housing, uh, groups are paying for houses. Um, so in my particular, uh, county in New Hampshire, uh, it's called Stratford County. Everything in New Hampshire is broken down by county. Um, and then within that county, there's the towns that those housing authorities then service. So even if you have a voucher in a given town, they will let you use that voucher in another town because there's such a shortage in, in the individual towns. What's been really cool about that whole experience is if you're good and provide good units and good care and are do well for the tenants and they like you, obviously they're looking for units as well. And so it's, they're very nice and they recommend you. And so I could tell they had a meeting about a week ago because I, all of a sudden out of the thin blue, thin blue air, uh, I got like a dozen emails and phone calls. So clearly a bunch of people had gotten their voucher and they were excited that they finally had gotten their voucher and, uh, and they wanted to talk about that. So we'll talk about those numbers throughout the course of the time together today. Um, yeah. So lots to cover. Um, and then an eviction story. I have a nice eviction story, which, um, which is, uh, always fun because we don't, we share the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, thankfully there's a lot more good than there is bad. And there's a lot more, uh, good than there is certainly way more good than there is ugly. Um, ugly. I can probably count on, I can I, probably two hands. I can count the ugly. So, um, so the ugly is really not that bad. Um, and if it's, and if your ugly is more than that, you're not doing something right. So we'll just put that out there. Um, Fresca is my friend for the day. Very refreshing. Mike and Dion always say they can't go three hours. They can. It's just a matter of the appropriate beverage. Um, the appropriate beverage. Uh, and I'm not a coffee guy. No coffee. This is me sans caffeine. So we don't like introducing caffeine into the situation. Um, that gets crazy. So let's jump in on some questions first. Just get some highs into this. Um, like I said, guys, always super excited to be here with you today. Um, and yeah, we're going to have a, we're going to cover a lot of stuff. There's a lot of new stuff. So if you're a landlord, there's a lot of stuff we're going to cover today for landlords. If you're not a landlord yet, but thinking about it, feel free to ask questions. There are no stupid questions. Um, there truly are. I really don't believe that there's any stupid questions when it comes to this stuff. It's just a matter of the person not having gotten to that point. So don't worry that I'm going to out you, call you an idiot, any of those other things. I'm far more likely to call an existing landlord an idiot for something that they're doing because they should have that part of their game. Um, but uh, yeah, we just have fun here. We're, you know, no idols here. So we're just going to have some fun. So let's jump in. Let's have some fun. Um, Janet Santiago, good morning, Lumberjack. Good morning. First, how's your daughter? Uh, so we covered that. Uh, she's doing great. Yep, she's doing well. Thank you again for all your prayers. Each and every prayer matters to us. So we're grateful for each and every one. We do believe in prayer. And so we are just waiting for our miracle and uh, and really honestly, faithfully hoping, expecting and believing it's going to happen. So uh, she's a very rare cancer, 8% cure rate. And so um, we're doing well. We're doing well. She's doing well. So thank you guys for caring and for your well wishes. Um, I have a question, which store are you buying all your kitchen, uh, all your kitchen and bathroom appliances besides Lowe's? Great question. Those of you who watch the show for me on a time, you know that I absolutely cannot stand a couple of the big box stores. One of them I specifically hate the absolute most is the one that, uh, for me, for me has never stood behind their manufacturer promises or their sale promises. Um, and, uh, I continue to be disappointed for about two years to where I finally just said, you're not getting 40 or 50 grand of my money every year to uh, continue to disappoint me. So uh, that's going to be a hard pass. So where am I buying those appliances? Uh, that's a great question. So um, what I did was I called a couple local guys, um, um, not big box stores. They're decent size, but they're local. Um, so I called a couple of them. I said I was prepared with this is what my volume is. Um, so I kind of gave them uh, basically a checklist. I would recommend that you do this as well. And for you guys that are smaller landlords, maybe only a couple of units, but I would talk to them about the fact is, you know, 
I would start off with the numbers of number of appliances that you own. I think that that's important. So when I talked to these places, I said, to put it in perspective, I own about 90 refrigerators. So I personally am the owner of over 400 appliances. Yay me. Um, it just means I have a bunch of stuff I have to fix. Uh, so I am the landlord of enough units where I have over 400 appliances. I have almost 100 refrigerators. I have almost 100 stoves. I have almost 100 milk microwaves. Um, and then I have, you know, 40 or 50 dishwashers. Uh, and I have uh, probably 70 washing machines and 70 dryers. So uh, real quick on the math, that's five, close to 500. So we're at almost 500 appliances. Um, to give you an idea is just, it's again, it's painting in their mind's eye. And you want to try and talk to the, I would try and talk to the owner. Um, that's what I did for these smaller appliance stores. I tried, I just said I'd like some time with the owner. I'm a you know large purchase. I'm a large purchaser uh, of, uh, of appliances. Um, and then just have the conversation with him and say, you know, my expectation is, is that, you know, we'll spend, um, I covered how many appliances I have. I covered what my typical annual spend is. And I covered what my projected spend is over the next year based on unit acquisition. Um, and I said, you know, to kind of paint the picture of if I even just do four units this next year, I'm going to need 20 plus appliances. There's no one else, largely speaking, that you're selling to that's going to need 20 appliances. So my expectation really is two things. It is one, uh, service and making sure that we can get things turned around quickly and never play the game with me of, oh, yeah, we can order it. No, nope, I don't want I can order it. I want I have it in stock. So asking the question around what they have in stock is really important. Um, what they carry in stock, because I need to be able to pick up the phone and know that when my dryer goes and I can't get, you know, we actually carry spares now because we have so many. So we carry a spare washer, spare dryer. We carry a lot of that spare stuff, spare refrigerator. Um, and I'm not saying that you have to do that early on, but you want to make sure that that store that you're going to pick is trying to kind of what I call a one throat to choke. One throat to choke is they do service they do appliances. And if you find a place that's great for service and a place that's great for appliances, you don't have to have one throat to choke, but it's just kind of perspective. Um, because when I can pick up the phone, I can call the owner and he's over the services side and he's over the sales side. Guess who's going to get uh, skipped in the schedule? Uh, not me. Um, and so I just want the matter handled and handled quickly. Or even understanding that, hey, this is a special client. Yeah, we kind of need to get out there even though it's 4.30. <clears throat> We kind of need to get out there and get it taken care of or put them first on the list for the next morning. Um, so I want that extra level of service. And then the next thing that I want is I want pricing concessions. If I'm going to give you that much margin or if I'm going to give you that many deals, I need to be, it needs to be a little bit less margin because I'm not nearly as much of a headache as a normal retail purchaser. Um, that's the second thing. Third thing is talking to them about scratch and dent. Um, every appliance company has scratch and dents. Um, for me, um, largely speaking, if it's on the two sides of the back, I don't care so long as it's not impacting the performance of the unit. So, so long as it's not perfect, uh, impacting the performance of the unit, so long as it's sides or back, I'm good with the damage. I don't really care. Um, if it is something that's on the front, I just want a picture of it. Just send me a little quick picture of it and I'll see if it's something I can live with. <clears throat> um, I've bought something that, these guys don't have the time to order parts, replace parts, things like that. So I had gotten a stainless steel fridge. It was a $2,600 fridge. Um, it was going in a higher end unit and the front panel was dented. They were able to sell it to me for 1200 bucks. Kind of a no brainer. I bought it for 1200 bucks. I bought the part on eBay for, I think $400. Um, it was an hour and a half of somebody's time to put that part back on. So I was into a basically... The same fridge that I would have walked in and paid 26, 2700 bucks for with delivery. Um, I ended up paying, you know, about all in like 15, 1600 bucks right around there. So I saved myself a thousand dollars, got a super nice high end fridge and boom, there you go. And the only damage to it was that front panel. So easy to swap and change. Um, so we just covered for about mm, seven to 10 minutes. We covered the appliance side of things. Um, again, because I don't source that out to property managers, this is the type of stuff that I know all day long. I want to have my hands in my business 
And so for me, it's not just about unit acquisition. It is about unit acquisition and then pulling out the inefficiencies in the business, which is now I've got a pretty good appliance game. Um, you know, now I've got a pretty good kitchen game. So being able to do those things, I buy in volume or I can buy in volume now, but I understand what things cost. And I also understand that that relationship, like I always talk about that relationship makes a difference. I can pick up the phone at four o'clock and if I really have a big issue, I can get somebody to come out on site. So, um, that's kind of it on the appliance side. Janet, um, is, yeah, I would talk to a couple of locals, um, talk to them about service, talk to them about price, talk to them about um, availability. Um, I don't want any of those places that have a model on the floor and they say, yeah, we can get anything within three to five days from the from, from the warehouse. That usually doesn't fit. That's usually not a fit for a landlord, certainly not one that wants to maintain um, maintain their reputation. I just realized that I had not put my phone on silent yet, and we need to make sure that happens. Otherwise, this thing will go off like a banshee because, as always, forgot to co cover the ground rules. You will see me look at my phone. The reason for that is I have people that are always working, and so I want to be there to support them and not have them waiting on an answer for an hour or two because I'm doing this. So um, you will see me look at my phone. You will see me answer questions. I will tell you, hold on a second, <laughs> so I can answer the question. Um, but that's basically it. So um, like I said, you will see me working on the phone because I'm here means I'm not in the field working, which means I need to make sure that people are supported. So Janet, hopefully that answers the question. Uh, Janet, with another question, uh, do you want to share your real estate predictions for 2022 first home buyer? Um, my predictions for 2022 are, I think the market is up next year. Um, I don't think it's up double digits like a lot of others do. Um, I think that unless really, it's really comes down to, to, to two core things. One is interest rates. Um, and then two really moreover is Washington doing some sort of a buying pro program for first time home buyers um, that will pull forward demand that will put people in the game that necessarily shouldn't be in the game. And then as you guys know, on the mortgage side, debt to income DTI, um, the debt to income, depending on what they start monkeying around with those numbers and the fastest way to make that DTI basically disappear or largely become irrelevant is to go from a 30 year mortgage to a 40 year mortgage. So if they start making those 40 year mortgages available for purchase and those are more broadly available, that is also going to create a, more of a frenzy. Um, the problem that Mike Zuber and I from one rental at a time, the problem that both Mike and I have is that everything that they're doing is pushing on the demand side and not pushing on the inventory side. And the inventory side of things is just as critical. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my thought. Sorry. A little bit of, a little bit of beard work, no oil this morning. So I'm a little bit dry. All right. So yeah, so my predictions for 2022 are, I think the market's up. I don't think it's up nearly as much as, um, as Goldman Sachs, I think Goldman Sachs called for 16%. I think that number is nuts. Um, I think there will be blips next year. Um, and I think that uh, I've been on record for the last, I don't know, 90, 90 days, I think since about September, um, talking about the fact that I think that uh, we're going to get another you know, kick in the Coronas this year. Um, I think Corona is going to be tough this winter because of the type of um, – virus that it is. Um, and so I think that, I think that this winter is going to suck a little bit. Um, and that's what we're prepared for, quite frankly. Um, so that's my prediction for 2022. I think there's going to be programs for first time buyers. Um, I think that, uh, the administration wants to do more on the two, threes and fours. I still believe that a two, three or four unit property is going to be the best performing asset for the next uh, three to five years is still what I believe. Um, I think it's going to be better than single family. And I think it's going to be better than large multifamily because I don't like the debt structure. Mike and I talk about it all the time. We don't like the, lar the debt structure on large multifamily. <sighs> Refreshing. Faraz, good morning. Good morning to you, sir. Um, Janet, with Janet's on fire. I love it, Janet. Well done. Uh, Matt, I want to be financially free after losing my small business because of the pandemic. I get it. I want to buy a duplex in 12 months. Yep. Thanks for the information. 
Janet, you're more than welcome. Um, I think that that's a great goal. Um, fill me in below on why you think it needs to be a duplex. That's what I'd love to know because um, my strategy is not duplex first. My strategy is a quad first if you can do it. And that's if you have kids, whatever. I, I'll talk I'll talk you guys through that today. Um, Janet, if you want to be my guinea pig, I'll talk you through it. Um, so, yeah, happy to do that. Invest Wealth, good morning. Good morning, Rob. Touch Philly Lumberjack, you know it. <clears throat> Isn't that funny, right? Guy from New Hampshire is a touchy feely guy instead of the Californian. Mike's so nice. He's such a nice guy. Even off, like, I would say that um, that's why I like the guys the most is because they're the most authentic. Um, they're exactly the way they are on camera. They're exactly that way off camera. They're just super dudes. They're good guys. Uh, we would hang out a lot if we were closer together. Uh, we still kind of hang out on calls and stuff like that beforehand. So I was saying that if no one showed up for the Thanksgiving live cast, we could at least hang out with each other for an hour. <laughs> and then all you, all you people showed up and ruined our party. I'm just teasing. We had a party with you. So that was a lot of fun. Tamika L., good morning, friend. Good morning, Tamika. Always great to see you um, or hear from you, see from you. Uh, Chester Williams, Matt, was the Thanksgiving live stream on your channel? Yes, it was. I did get an announcement from either Michael or Dion's channel. Yes, so it was on my channel. Um, that was one of the things about going live through Zoom is it's a little bit of a challenge getting a live event onto YouTube where you actually invite other people. Um, and I don't know if that's by design. So there's a lot of third party ways to do it. And so that was our venture or that was my venture into doing zoom. Um, there's a better way to do it. And I found that better way to do it. Um, because yeah, that was a little bit atrocious the first like 10 minutes of that video, but I figured it out eventually. Um, but I couldn't start and stop and restart, but I have a new way of doing it. Um, it's different than what I originally saw. So yes, they all announced it on their um, they all announced it on their channels beforehand, um, and that was also really kind of before the three amigos of financial independence, three amigos of FI. Um, that was before that Facebook group really took off, and that Facebook group now I think in less than I think it's just about a week, and I think we already have like three hundred and fifty uh, members. So if you're not part of the um, Three Amigos of FI on Facebook. Definitely uh, definitely request that, and you'll see somebody turn that around pretty quickly for you um, as far as letting you in the group. So, yes. Tamika L., very thankful for the report on the little one. She's so precious, still praying. Tamika, thank you very much. We appreciate, as I always say, we appreciate every single prayer. Um, Eliana is doing super awesome. Um, so, yeah, really, really good. Um, we're, we're very blessed with the reports that we're getting. Um, for any of you who've ever known anybody going through chemo or have done it yourself, it's horrible. Um, there's just, it's just the, the only, that's why we all, I think everybody puts so much hope in the report that you then get. So, cause it's such a horrible, long, painful experience. Um, and, uh, but yeah, we're very blessed and things, things are going well. So thank you very much. Uh, Rob, do you have any videos about what you should do best practices when inheriting tenants from a seller? Um, I do. Um, so we did, we, we've done a few of those. I know that, um, so again, another great reason for the three amigos, right? Dion loves getting units with renters. <clears throat> Mike loves getting empty units and I don't care. I'm kind of like Jerry Seinfeld. I always end up even, but we do end up ahead. Uh, you know, which is kind of funny because we just don't care. We kind of let the situation kind of dictate in that regard where we'll take a, if, if the deal's good enough, we'll take a unit with tenants. Um, even if the deal's not good enough, if I really see something specific with a property, um, the one that I just bought for 1.31 million, 12 units, I was inheriting a few tenants that I, I have no desire to renew their lease. Um, I've seen that landlord was a slumlord. Um, I'm going to improve the unit, make it nicer, see if that changes things a little bit and that they're, they're just acting the way that they are because of the type of unit that they have um, and because the landlord was not responsive and didn't take care of maintenance. So I've gone out of my way to, to do a lot of maintenance to make sure that they recognize there's a new sheriff in town and we do things a little bit differently. If you guys can hear it, that's my daughter in the background. She probably just didn't get her way. 
Um, that's her newest thing. I definitely ready for that phase to pass. Um, or it could be like my sister where the phase never passed. <laughs> so, so we'll see. Um, but yeah, so for, uh, for there are, there is a video on there, Rob, for best kind of best practices when inheriting a tenant. Um, the first thing that I do, um, just kind of real briefly, kind of three points. The first thing that I do is I reach out to them. I reach out to them very, very, very quickly. Um, I have a letter on their door the day that I close. The day that I close, letter on the door. And it basically says, hi, here's who we are. This is what we do. We do own other units. We do have repairmen that we work with. Um, you know, please let me know of any ongoing issues. Uh, we recognize that, um, you know, that, uh, that we approach being landlords differently than many others. So please, we'd like to hear from you as to what the issues are. Um, and then after we've heard back from everybody, we'll then create a full and complete list. And then you'll hear from us in scheduling time to get people on site. So expect that process to take a week or two. That has given us an absolutely phenomenal return uh, from our tenants, um, which we call our clients. It's given us a phenomenal return from them. It's made sure that they understand that we aren't there to just milk money out of the property. We truly want to give a great experience. So the first thing that I would recommend in acquire and when you have new, when you're having tenants that are inherited, the very first thing that I would do is make sure that you introduce yourself, make sure you let them know that this is what the process is. Um, this is what you do. Um, I give them my cell phone number, my email, um, and let them know that I want them to reach out to me with via email with their information. Um, and then instantly, if people don't get back to you, then you know that, okay, they're kind of a little bit on my radar, quite frankly. Um, and then if I haven't heard anything from them, guess what I do? I post that same, I post a letter that's only slightly different, um, which basically starts off with, hey, we haven't heard from you, wanted to make sure you got our letter. And then we post that. And that's usually posted three to four days after the first one's posted. Yep. Yep. We always ask for the tenant roster uh, from the previous landlord. We also ask for their, any contact information they have for them. Um, or we ask them to get it before the closing. Sometimes that, sometimes we get that. Sometimes we don't. I know that Mike is religious about that. He's very good at that. Um, that's, that's definitely part of his system is uh, I forget what he calls it, but it's this basically that's this document, which, you know, shares all the information from the tenant um, <clears throat> with the landlord. We, we ask for that every time. Um, but for some reason, you know, people have been able to avoid it and not give it to us. And that's usually a red flag for us that we know we're about to probably deal with some problems or run into a hornet's nest. Um, this last deal that I did with 12 inherited tenants or 12 inherited 12 units. And I think uh, 27 tenants, Nope. Sorry. Uh, 17 tenants. Sorry. Yep. 12 units, 17 tenants um, was that there were 47 work items, 47 work items that they wanted to have addressed. That's what came across in the letter. And that wasn't even every tenant reaching out to us. I think there were three, three or four that didn't reach out to us. So yeah. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things that I do inheriting tenants is I post that letter. I post another one in three to five days. If I still have nothing from them, then I start using all the information that I got, um, you know, from closing, like their email address, their phone number. At that point, I start that process. Um, I've still had one tenant in that building that I've not spoken with. They won't reach out to us. Their rent keeps on showing up. Their rent has shown up both times, um, actually once. So it was November. The rent show up, showed up in November, and uh, I suspect it will be there in December. And if not, something might be going on there, but there's nothing more I can do. Um, so, yeah, they just don't want to talk to me. That's fine. So that's what I do for um, inheriting tenants from a seller um, is I do that. Um, and then after the other thing, too, is it's the the – process or the purpose of that letter is to let them know we know business, let them know we know what we're doing, let them know that we have processes and people in place. And I always tell them to reach out and, and, and introduce themselves. Um, then that way in that first week, I likely have touched all the tenants except for maybe one. In this case, I've, I've touched them all multiple times. Um, so they know, they know who we are, they know what we do. 
they've seen of that 47 or 48 items that were on the list, we've already addressed over 40 of them. So um, others were kind of bigger projects, long, more like longer term. So not what we would deem emergency, um, like some windows. So we did some window repairs, but we we're actually replacing all 84 windows in the building this year. We just, and so we told them, we said, the repair that we're going to do there is meant to basically stave us till, you know, springtime where we can put in the new windows. We're just going through the process right now of ordering those windows. That's brutal right now. I just had a company give me 30 weeks. They said 30 weeks before I get my windows. Yeah, I said, you're not going to get the business. She's like, well, anybody else is going to be that long. You're wrong. You need to call around your competitors. Um, so I talked to all three of her competitors and no one was anywhere near 30 weeks. The next closest was 20 weeks. I actually found my preferred vendor was only eight weeks. So guess who's getting the business? It's probably them. I won't use their name because I think they might, I think they have some people that watch my channel. So I won't say who they are. Sorry. Because price matters. I'm a little bit of a diva when it comes to price. I don't want to pay retail. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps Rob. Chester Williams, uh, did Michael do his daily news this morning? I didn't get an alert, even though I have all notifications. I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I actually missed it this morning. I was playing with the kids. So I usually don't do anything Sunday mornings. Um, we're usually church or um, I'm just hanging out with my kids. Making sure that they get undivided daddy time. Undivided, uninterrupted. Uh, let's see. No, they sell first. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Tamika L. Question. As a W-2 employee, real estate investor, and husband, father with small children, what do you do to maintain the quality work-life balance? <laughs> That's a great question, Tamika. Um, so part of you feels like no matter what, you're failing. Guaranteed. Um, that you always should be spending time more on something, on, on, on one of the other things. Um, I think you just have to be an amazing, amazing time manager. And you really have to spend time on the things that are valuable. I think far too often we find people um, that spend way too much time on things that don't mean anything in the grand scheme of things. Um, that's actually one of my biggest bones to pick with people that wonder why they're smart, but they're not successful. It's because they put way too much focus on the wrong or on the stupid things. Um, as somebody who's, who operates multiple companies, um, I am very, very, very good at uh, disaster arbitrage, which really comes down to seeing the whole picture and then identifying the order in which things need to be done. Um, and that's, as you, that's the biggest, um, that's one of the biggest skills that you have to get in order to get big at doing any company is, you know, I've, you know, uh, much like Mike, I've taken ideas from zero to, you know, eight figures. Um, I've taken um, companies that were on their way out and pulled them completely back. Um, you know, that we're doing a few hundred thousand dollars a year in sales. And when I left, you know, two years later, they were going to do 10 million. Um, and I'm, so that's what I do in the corporate world is I've been a, for a, a number of companies, I've been a fixer. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that's, so that's always a challenge. So to give you an idea, an idea of a typical day, um, 6 a.m., I'm usually up with my son. So I'm spending quality time with him, um, you know, talking about things, talking about the day, uh, talking about, believe it or not, properties. My kids are going to have an extremely, that was one of the things that I felt I didn't get as a kid was really my, because my parents didn't own a business or my mom didn't own a business. Later on in life, she became a real estate broker. Um, and so that's where some of the stuff that I learned was because she was a single mom. So I was in the car with her um, having to go to showings. Um, on Saturdays because I was too young to be left home alone. And so I had to go sometimes. Excuse me. So, <clears throat> yeah. So the biggest, most important thing is time management. Um, 6 a.m. So I've already done the night before in prep for my day. I've already told the guys that are working the next day. 
I've already told them, here's the list of things we need to accomplish for the week. And here's what I want you working on tomorrow. If a call comes in, that's an issue. Um, Ashley, my wife or I were on the group text message. And so we set up a group text message. We really run the company by text. Um, so if something comes in, that's an emergency. And we, we obviously know what the people are that we have working for us are doing that day. Um, they're not employees. They are subs. Uh, but they, they do when they're working for us for a day, let's say, we'll just say, Hey, this is what the plan is for the day, but it's always subject to change. That's what they kind of know. And a lot of times, um, you know, it might be a plumbing issue. Then we send a plumber. If it's an electrical issue, we send an electrician. Um, because we do so much volume with those places, we have a little bit of a preference on that. We are able to get them out there kind of quickly, typically. Um, and those are the relationships that we're looking for. So my morning usually starts with my son, um, and then, you know, 6.30 to 7 or so, my wife and Eliana are usually up. Um, and then I have a second daughter who's the middle child. She sleeps late. So she sleeps until like 8 or 8.30. So we kind of say hi to her in the morning. Um, and then I am in my office at 8.30. Um, I'll usually come out and have lunch with my kids. Um, I'm working the rest of the day. And then usually around 5 30 or 6 I come out and or 5 30 I usually come out and we do dinner um and then it's bath time bedtime cleanup you know and uh then spend some time with my wife we usually talk a little bit about the properties um sometimes um but usually we're all up to date because of text messages throughout the day and then she usually goes to bed 8 30 to 9 o'clock and then I work I work from usually about 9 p.m. to usually about midnight, just making sure the next day is ready, making sure we handled any issues, making sure we got any paperwork filled out that we needed to have filled out, um, made sure that we got some, you know, any bills paid. Um, and obviously the first of the month is busiest because that's when we're getting all of our rent checks. Um, but I'd say 85% of our payments are online. So um, as far as payments that we make, 95%. 5% we still write check for. I'd say of payments that we're receiving, like rents and things like that, um, 85% is online. So we only have 15%. Um, so that's how I manage my time. But that's a typical day for me. Um, it's usually, I'd say, 6 to midnight is a pretty typical day for me. Uh, and that's, uh, that's Monday through Friday. Saturday is just filled with you know talking more with my wife about property stuff. Um, or follow up with contractors. We like to support those guys that are really hard workers, um, guys that are trying to have a side hustle. We love those guys. Um, they're trying to do better for their family. We're trying to do better for ours. So when the last economy went boom, boom in eight, nine, and 10, we we were the, a, a largely speaking, we supported a lot of those guys because we were still doing projects. So I've done a decent amount of work now, but I have not done... Um, We've done more deals this year than we've ever done this, this in 2021. We've done more deals than we ever, sorry, I had to look at what, what year it was. Uh, but we've done more deals in 2021 than we had in 2020 or any other year. But the reason, the main reason for that was because we 1031 out of three properties. So that forced our hand to buy a lot more because we had the terms around the 1031s. Ah, excuse me. Um, so that is the work-life balance. I don't have one. It's pretty bad. Um, but my kids, I'm always available to my kids. Um, and I always spend time with them. So on Saturdays, it's really all about the kids, but they're involved. I want them to be involved in the business and see that daddy and mommy work hard for our family. And so my kids, a lot of times on Saturdays, even when we're going out and doing something, before we go out and do something, we'll stop off and see a couple properties. Um, either ones that we're shopping for or existing ones where we heard that there was an issue that week. So we can kind of follow up and see that the contractor did X, Y, or Z. Um, and that really is our life. It's our life. So, yep. So, uh, yeah, so success was not lucky and it wasn't a mistake. It's very deliberate how we live our life. Um, and then as far as the W-2 employee thing, I'm actually a good executive. So it is demanding my time and there, you just have to, ebbs and flows, right? So sometimes I'm having to answer a call uh, at 10 o'clock at night. It's fine. Whatever. Um, in fact, I'll actually try and put it for my overseas stuff. Um, 
because I have overseas stuff that will manage. And so I'll try and put that between my nine and midnight and I just do it then. So that's how I manage. Uh, I will not be coming out with a book like that. You probably get that reference. The cool people in the group. Um, all right. So next question, uh, Chester Williams. I've heard both ways about adding utilities to rent. What's your take on utilities and rent? Great question. So if we are, um, if it is a non-housing unit, we do not include, do not include. The only exception to that rule is if, it, is if the house only has one meter or if the house only has one heating system, but believe it or not, we'll actually spend the money to separate the meter or separate the heating system. The only thing that we won't spend all the money doing is we won't do that for water and sewer. Um, we may get to that someday, but we, we have not yet. Um, so, uh, my belief is if not a housing unit, um, IE for a housing authority, uh, section eight voucher program, et cetera. Um, we, we do not include it. We have them pay for it and take care of it themselves. Yep. Excuse me. That's my take. Crimson Knight. Good morning, matey. Good morning. Chester Williams, are there any particular appliance brands you'd prefer, recommend, and conversely avoid? Yes, there are. <laughs> Chester, you know I was going to have an opinion on this, right? Um, so based on my own personal experience, owning 400 plus appliances, um, I avoid Bosch and Electrolux. Won't touch them either. Um, and look and make sure that whatever brand that you're buying isn't just white labeling a Bosch or an Electrolux. Um, because there are some, I think it's some Maytags or Electrolux, I think. Um, so look and see who the manufacturer is um, and make sure that it's a model that isn't being manufactured by, by Maytag, but it is Electrolux. Um, and I could be wrong on those names. Um, again, just my experience. Um, uh, Samsung washers and dryers. Nope. Um, LG washers and dryers. Nope. Electrolux washers. Electrolux anything. I will not use. Um, Bosch anything. Nope. Um, we do a lot of, um, Whirlpool, Whirlpool, Maytag, and GE. Um, and then they have like chef series, gallery series, things like that. We'll usually do the higher end stuff there. Um, but yeah, GE, Maytag, Whirlpool for a lot of our stuff. Um, what else? It's usually those. No LGs, no Samsungs. And no Hisense. Mm -mm. Um, like I said, the engineering on all those products could be really, really good. But the experience that I've had fixing them or getting them fixed has more than sucked. So, um, yeah. So I stick with those main, uh, Yep, Maytag, Maytag, Whirlpool, GE. I know there's more. Maybe Kenmore. Hmm. A majority of the stuff that we buy now is those three brands, and we've had very good luck. So that's the answer to that question, Chester. Um, Okay, invest to wealth. Your extra appliances, do you keep them in storage? Pay for a storage fee. Uh, when you're our size, we actually have um, we actually have storage space. So we have, um, I actually specifically bought a building. And the reason that I bought the building was it came with about 2,500 square feet of storage space. Yep. That's why I bought the building. Um, perfect property for us. We have, it allows me to buy in bulk. 
Um, so outlets, switches, um, lights, uh, LED pancake lights, wire, um, things that a great landlord buys in bulk. $100,000 pyramid. Um, so we, yeah, we buy a lot of stuff in bulk now because it, I, I am, as you guys always hear, we talk about the control board, levers, knobs, buttons. I want to just optimize my business. And so when I know that we're going to do six units rehab this year, guess what? I know that that's probably 150 outlets. Figure 25 outlets per, per unit. So if I know that that's 25 units or 25 outlets, I don't want to pay $2 an outlet. So I will buy them from cash flow for the business. I will buy them from cash flow. I will buy 500 and I'll have a couple of years worth. Um, and that's how we do it because my cost isn't $2 at that point. It's more like 60 cents. So I just effectively changed the, the cost structure of doing a rehab. Um, it's the same thing with like pancake lights. I'll wait until the vendor says, oh, I'll ask five boxes left. Great. What will you take for all five? Five fifty a piece? Perfect. Retail's eight. Or retail, you know, retail online is eight. Retail at Home Depot is 12. So I just effectively did it for less than half the price. And again, you figure a typical, we just did a unit, it was 24 lights. Six times 24, it's 150 bucks. Anytime I can pick up that money and that I have it in stock, that I don't have to order it and wait for it or B, have to have a contractor waiting for it, or C, I know when the contractor is ready, I basically say, hey, you're starting tomorrow, or we talk about it a week before, hey, give me a list. I get the entire list there, and then they show up, and the list of the stuff that they have to do next is all there. So we're pretty smart as an organization like that um, and managing projects like that, um, and that's that level of efficiency just means more and more profit. The fact that I manage it myself saves a GC cost of, you know, typically 10 to $15,000. Um, literally getting somebody to just go drop off that material is much, much, much less than what that guy is going to have to go spend and then collect from me. Um, as far as the margin that he's going to, you know, pump that stuff up, you know, 10, 15, 20%. I don't need to worry about that. I'm controlling my costs. I'm buying it less and he's buying it retail. He'll spend 3000 bucks in material. He'll upcharge it 20% having to go pick it up, drop it off, carry it, blah, blah, blah. But my 3000 is more like 2000. And then I pay somebody a hundred bucks to drop it all off out of my storage. I'm 2100 for the same thing. that was going to cost 36, 3600. You look at that over the course of an entire project for rehabbing a couple of units. Yeah, you guessed it. I'm way ahead of the game. I've got a ton more extra cash, um, which is just makes my life easier. So to answer your question, I do not have a, I do have a storage facility. I don't pay storage. Um, and that's why the piece on the appliance side is so important until you are big, you need to make sure that you're dealing business with a guy that are dealing business with a company that always has at least a little bit of inventory there. That way, if you're in a pinch and a dryer dies and they, you know, and you know it's dead, dead, or it's 20 years old and it doesn't make sense to fix it, just get a new one. That's the case. He says, yep, I've only got a couple in stock, but this is what I have. And they need to be the brands that you want. Um, I know what the brands are I want. So I deal businesses that deal most in those brands. That's what was my kind of final decision for picking the person I picked. Hopefully that helps. Tamika L, I love the scratch and dent section. Oh, I know, it's the best. It's normally something very small and unnoticeable. It absolutely is. 90% of the time, it's small and noticeable. If it's not small and noticeable, or even if it is, um, get a manager. Get a manager to come over and just say, yeah, there's this dent here. Like, who else is going to buy that other than somebody on scratch and dent? Perfect opportunity to save a few hundred bucks. And, I mean, as you guys tell with the way that I do things, I act like it's my money. Because it is. It's my money. I want to save that in profit. Yeah. So I care about those details. I just care about spending an extra couple hundred bucks. Um, if it's the difference of having it available to a tenant and not having it available to a tenant, then I will spend the more money to have it available to them. But if it's on my side and a preparedness issue on my side, that's where I want to invest time, invest the money, et cetera. 
So yeah, that's what we do. Um, Crimson Knight, I wish I could get that relationship. Let's see how my Lowe's fridge arrives today. So far, so for my Manchester duplex, you would recommend a thousand dollar plus fridge because it's a higher end unit. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I mean, depends on what you have for space. The apartment building that I just bought, they put cabinets in and it only really fits one kind of refrigerator, not one kind, but one size because smaller than that is a specialty fridge. Um, the size that they got is about like, <clears throat> is like an economy fridge. The bigger ones don't fit. They come out like six inches past the counter. Um, and so, yeah, so for that one, I'm a little bit stuck, but I always measure the space. Measure the space, make the decision based on that for sure. Yes, for sure. Um, but yeah, I would go with a nicer fridge. I mean, nicer finishes is why people stay. You know, so for us, um, you know, well, you guys can look at two Whittier Falls Way in Dover, New Hampshire. Two Whittier Falls Way in Dover, New Hampshire. You can see before pictures. You can see after pictures there. Look at my video, actually, on my on my channel. Uh, I did a full video of what the place looked like before, what the place looked like afterwards. That entire kitchen I did for twelve grand. It was not not that expensive. Um, and then the appliances, I think there we went super high end. And we were still less than five in that kitchen. So, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Don, uh, have in-laws over. We'll have to watch later. Everyone have a great day. <laughs> Thanks, Don. My prayers with you. Um, Nisi? Hey, Nisi. Uh, have a two-bed, one-bath sitting on an acre. Wanted to put another unit on it. Okay. And permits and such made me nuts. Yep. What are some other ways to monetize this land? That uh, What would the lumberjack do? Um, I always follow code on stuff. So um, yeah, I'd be looking at uh, 80. Yeah, I'm permitting. Sorry. I, I just, on stuff like that, we've gotten to the point where I think when I was a smaller company, I might have considered doing something a little bit rogue. Um, now I don't. We're just we're, we're too big. We're too big now with, you know, about, I mean, with just density. You know, we've got just about 100 units in three smaller towns. I mean, the combined population of these three towns is maybe 70, 75,000. So I don't want to get a bad reputation. I want to do the right thing. Um, so... I would, I would go through the permit process. I would do an ADU. Yep. And just understand, talk to, look for an attorney, um, look for an attorney who's done ADU stuff with that city that you're in or town that you're in. Um, that's the most important question. If you don't, if you don't want to call every attorney in town, just look at the town meeting notes, uh, probably planning board on the last few companies that have suggested or, or proposed such a thing. And you'll see who the attorneys are there. Um, and just look for ones that look like what you're trying to do. Don't look for the guy building a 150 unit complex. Um, but just look for the land, look for the uh, look for the guys who proposed those types of projects. Um, look for those. Um, and then just have a conversation with them. But try and do apples to apples just because if you know he's done something really close to what you're doing before. He's going to save time. He's going to save money. He's going to know what the process is um, and make sure that there's a level of frequency there as well. So that's what I would do. Um, Chester Williams, my concern about getting into real estate investing is I'm a high cost housing area. Yep. With low yields. Yep. And I don't know much about out of markets, out of state investing. With RE appreciation going up next year, what do you recommend? Um, so I never buy based on appreciation. Um, I do believe the market, generally speaking, will be up, but I think there will be markets that are down. So I think that there's going to be markets next year where they're up 15%, and I think there's going to be markets next year that are actually down. I think nationally speaking, we're up, but I think there are going to be good and bad markets, number one. Number two, um, I never buy for appreciation, so I'm not trying to just jump into the game just to make sure I'm not going to get behind. 
I'm still always looking for the deal that gives me the best return on capital, ROC. It delivers the rock, ROC, return on capital. Um, and so if you're in a high dollar area, I would start there. And after you've looked at it for you know 30 to 60 days and you've charted out, you can't shortcut it. After you've charted out 30, 60 days where, yep, it is continuous, uh, continuously a high cost area. Um, I would start to look at the stuff on the periphery of it. Um, I am, I am 15 minutes North of a place that sells $4 million condos. And you can buy a condo in my town for three and a quarter. So there's extremely expensive 15 minutes away from here. Um, and so just look at that, you know, look at that. If you're, if your area specifically is very expensive, start to look at the periphery of your area because again, jobs, people are looking for jobs. If that place is that because of jobs or because it's on the ocean, you have to evaluate, you know, some of those things, kind of the why it is that way. Um, so I don't quickly jump to out of state. What I quickly do is understanding my area, 30, 60 days in my area, really mastering that, understanding it, knowing it. Then based on that, if it really looks too expensive and yields are one, two, three percent, again, I look then I start to look at the periphery. Um, yeah, that's what I did. That's how I picked going to the second town that I went to and the third town that I went to. After I felt like, okay, I've got a great fingerprints on this, I've really understand this market, I know it inside and out. Where's my next one? Well, I looked, I didn't go South. I didn't go West. East is the ocean. And so I went North <laughs> kind of actually Northeast. That's how I did it. So that's what I would do, Chester. Um, I would be still looking at deals. Yep. Uh, Crimson Knight 921. So you really think my award layout converted, uh, Layout converted attics, two bedroom in Manchester can rent out for more than fifteen hundred. Yep, 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 yeah. And H housing is desperate. Yep. Uh, you need to be looking specifically, Crimson. You need to be looking specifically at whoever handled COVID funds for your area. That's who you need to be talking to. That's who you need to be talking to. They're right now. They're not your normal housing authority. They're kind of, I don't want to say a step above, but they're in a different situation. They're awarding vouchers 12 months to 18 months long for tenants. So yeah, you should be looking there and talking to them there and ask them what their rate is that they're paying. Cause I didn't offer my number. I asked them what they were paying and they gave me a range and I said, okay, Hey, if they walk the unit, and they hated it. They don't have to rent it. If they walk it and they like it, that's it. Very simple. I'm a libertarian, if you couldn't tell. So, yeah, so that's what I would do for sure. Uh, let's see. Oops. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. There we go. Chester. Okay. Chester Williams, for upgrading a unit, do you have a process on figuring out how much to invest in a unit and determining post-upgrade rents? I do. Um, I, uh, what's the best way? So when I've, when I'm buying the property, I've already kind of made up in my mind what I'm going to do. Um, it really is all over the map and here's why there's not a, there's not a hard and fast rule to X. Um, I don't like throwing people out of their units. I like keeping them. Um, I like not taking away their housing and shelter. Um, so I work with them and I just say, you know, this is what we're looking at. Uh, Dion's binder strategy. Uh, that's a great strategy. He's done a great job of documenting what that process is. So I would definitely look at Dion financial talk. I would look at his business strategy and how he does that from a rent perspective. Um, I think it's a great process. Um, I think that, um, it really depends. I've done it all. I've bought based on keeping the unit dated. Um, I've done it based on knowing that I was going to go in and gut because maybe the location was an A location, but the property was a C condition 
And so it just needed to get gone through. Um, so yeah, that's what I look at. Apparently you guys really didn't like that libertarian comment. Went from like 43 watchers to like 31. It's okay. If you knew what a libertarian was, you know I wouldn't care. <laughs> anyway. Um, so yeah, so that's what I would say. It, there's no um, hard and fast rule, Chester. Um, so I've bought stuff that's in an A area that was a C quality that because the tenant had been there for five years, I just said, okay, that's fine. We won't upgrade it right away. However, um, and a lot of times I'm taking over a lease. I just let them know up front, just so you know, we are going to do a rental increase. Um, and I don't know exactly what that is. So I actually just had, so I had a building that I bought two years ago. Um, when I bought it, it was a three bedroom, two bath house, single family house. They were renting it for a thousand dollars a month. Give me a break. That's ridiculous. In my market, that's ridiculous. A thousand dollars gets you a one bedroom apartment. Not even it gets you, doesn't even get you into the nicer new studios in the, in the area. So I said to them, I said, well, your rent is going to go up to 1650. They said, that's absolutely outrageous and ridiculous. Guys, it's not even close to market rent. I said, I'm going to give you a couple, I'm going to give you some time. So it's going to go up to 1650. It needs to be that because the other guy didn't have a mortgage on the building. Now I do. I have to cover my costs, my what I call my cost plus basis. Um, we put it at sixteen fifty. They didn't like it, but guess what? They stayed. So, um, with rents going nuts this year, I approached them again. I said, "Hey guys," I said, um, "just kind of giving you some notice um, in the springtime." This was in October. Um, I said, "In the springtime, I'm going to be raising this rent again, um, and it's going to be." probably eight, it's going to be in the 1800 to $2,000 a month range, still well under market. And the reason I know that is proof of fact. I actually have four, three bedroom, two baths that are, were apartments, not single family homes that are rented out. All of them rented out above $2,000 a month. So I wanted them to give it, give them a chance to stay, but I also wasn't going to take a massive hit. Wasn't going to do that. Nope. Wasn't going to do that. Um, so, so yeah. So then they sent me a letter saying that they're leaving. Okay. Sounds good. Honestly, best thing for them. They want to move into a place where they can pay. They're going to have to move towns um, because there's no way that they're getting a three bedroom, two bath house at 1650 or 1800 or even 2000. Cause I know what I rent them for. Um, so they're, they're moving towns. They're moving out of, uh, a single family home. They're going to have to be in an apartment. Um, and so they'll have all those things. Totally fine. All good. All good. I don't begrudge them at all. In fact, I'm actually ecstatic. The reason that I'm ecstatic is because my rent on that unit is going to be 2,400. So I'm going to make $750 a month more. It's just a no brainer. It's not even close. It's just a no brainer. Seven fifty a month more is what I'll be making on that building. So nine thousand dollars more a year I will make on that building. It's just not. It's not even close. So that's the dilly. That's the dilly ilio. Um, so hopefully that helps paint the picture for what I would do in a unit that really does range where it is, what it is. Um, as I always say, I will. Um, I will not own anything in a D class. I will own in an A, B, or C class, um, but my quality of product will be, um, it won't ever, I, usually will never be an A and an A. I won't start out there. It'll be a B and an A, a C and an A. Um, so, you know, I won't start with an A and an A. I won't like build, because AA is built brand new scratch. Not, not, not of interest to me right now, so. Hopefully that helps, Chester. That was a little bit of a muddled answer, but hopefully that's helpful. Um, invest to wealth. Yes, Mike did his daily news. Good. Excellent. Matthew Paris, good morning. Um, David E., did I hear you say you have a $2,400 fridge in one of your rental units? Yep. Do you only buy new? Not only, but mostly. Yep. I buy new for my B-class props and refurbish for my C-class props. Um, uh, 
we usually buy new. We're usually not buying refurbished. Um, yeah, not usually buying refurbished. But sometimes, sometimes, but not, not often. Uh, S. Young, 8100. Hey, S. Young, I've never seen your name before. So thanks for coming. Um, and David E., thanks for coming too. I don't think I've seen your name before either. So great. Thanks for good having you guys. Um, I have a large uh, large down payment that I would like to spread out over two or three properties. Okay, cool. But my W-2 income to loan amount uh, won't support three mortgages. So I just put it all into one deal. Any suggestions? So there's not a ton of data there. There's a lot of data missing there in order for me to give you like per true perspective. Um, my feeling is, is that anything that you can do um, multiple deals return on capital will pay you more money. It just will. Um, so I always look to stretch my dollars as far as I can stretch them. Um, so long as I'm not doing bad deals. So, um, the most important thing that I would do in your position is I would talk to a, di a few different lenders the reason I would talk to those few different lenders is I would get their feelings on what they want to see from you. Um, the reason why that really matters is because they're the ones that are going to approve or disapprove of your approach. There are some banks that are like credit unions, largely speaking, are extremely risk averse. They want to see you put all your money into one deal. There's other banks, usually smaller banks that are newly chartered in the last five years. A lot of times you can find a bank like that in your area. Largely, they're looking to grow their footprint. So they might not be as stodgy because they don't have as big of a portfolio in that area and they're looking for growth in that area. So having that conversation with them, they'd say, yeah, sure. So long as you're meeting these criteria, we'll let you do three deals. We'll let you do only X percent down. Um, that's what I would start to look at. So the first place that I would start would be a bank or a broker. That's the first place that I would start with that strategy, telling them exactly what you're trying to do. Um, because I do, I would rather have three deals working for me than one deal. That's that's me. Uh, Curbs and Night, 921. Smart, but focuses on unimportant stuff. Sounds like me three or four years ago. Still today, it lingers a lot. Hey, man, no judgment, but that's what happens, right? You become a landlord and you quickly realize where your time needs to be spent. And landlords that are unhappy are perfectionists largely speaking. They want to make the perfect the, the property perfect. I'm not saying you run a bunch of dumps. All of my properties are nice, but I can't make the property perfect. It is still a business. It still has to make some money and I have to grow. So I do the things, always do the things that have to be done. Almost always do the things that I'm, and I always do the things that should be done. The things that are in question are the things that people would like right? And we'll work with them. We'll give them those things every once in a while. You stay on board as a tenant. Sure. We'll do some of those things because there isn't the cost of turning over the unit. That just makes sense. That's just good business because you're working with the people you're dancing with the girl who brought you. And that's, I, that's what I do in my business is, you know, if you're six months in and you're already saying, I want this, I want this, I want this. Listen, let's talk about it. Come lease renewal time. Let's see how you are as a tenant. Let's learn to play together first. Anya Seiji. I hope I say your name right, Anya. I love your name, by the way. Um, it's beautiful. My daughter's name is Bryn, and my other daughter's name is Eliana, if that gives you any indication. Um, so love your name. And thanks for all you give. You're more than welcome. I'm excited to do this for you guys on Sundays. It's for me, too. I enjoy this time. Um Doing something for 20 something years and having all of the things that I've gone through, I knew that if I were in your spot 20 years ago and looking at this, I would love a guy that just did brain dumps once a week because I love to learn and I don't want to have to go through the experience myself. And I can tell you there are plenty of mistakes that I made that cost me thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars that I'm always wanting to share with folks. So, and help however we can. Um, but, 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 so Anya, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Matthew Paris, you're so lucky you were so deliberate with your time and energy that you were able to buy so much real estate. 
not everyone has the extra time between movies, games to achieve this. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I do have a buddy of mine that is probably, I don't know if they rank, they probably rank them at this point, but he's just a second, second level, like next level when it comes to uh, tour duty. And I get it. That's how he in, in, invests or spends his time into a totally goal. Cool. There's no judgment. But for me, I don't want to work forever. I, I am lazy in a different way that Dion's lazy. Um, I want to not work anymore and literally have my day be whatever I want it to be. And all I can say is 45, 6, 14. And you guys should probably know what that means. 45, 6, 14. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, but yeah, it's crazy. It's, it, you know, guys, it's where you spend your time. And I believe, I know that you guys can do it. I'm a ninth grade dropout. I figured out a lot of stuff on my own. There is so much education out there now. Holy cow. Oh my goodness. Like I'd be twice the size business wise. I can't get twice the size that I am now. Uh, but I would literally be twice the size company that I am now. If all of this stuff were available 20 years ago when I started, um, I still listen to stuff now, even to get my game better. I do. I am. I'm in uh, one rental at a time. I bought that. I, you know, I'm, I'm in that course. Um, the reason that I do that is because there's other people doing things that I'm not doing that are making plenty of money doing it. I want to get better. It's that constant pursuit of getting better and honing and creating another skill. Um, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in taking what I'm really good at, understanding that there's aspects to what I do that I'm not very good at. And I just want to grow it and blow it up. Um, I've never done a seller financing deal. I still haven't done a complete seller financing deal. I've done one that was part of a deal, but I haven't done a full seller financing deal before. Um, I will. I will. I just lost. I, I just, I lost that other one where I knew what my mistakes were. Um, and so, yeah, it sucks that I lost that, lost that deal. It was a decent deal. It wasn't a tremendous deal, but it was a decent deal. Um, and I'll be ready for the next one. And I have a team in place to deliver that. Now I've got the letter that I like. I've got an accountant that can talk to them. I have a lot of the things that I want and need to help me deliver that deal now. Sorry. Oh, it's so refreshing. What's really funny is that's a grapefruit, citrus, spring, sparkling water. I hate grapefruit. It's good as a liquid. It's gross as a fruit. So I don't know. I know. Musings of a lumberjack. Uh, Tiffany White, hello and good morning. Hello and good morning. Oops. Yep. There we go. Sorry. So yes, good morning, Tiffany. Philip Ritchie. Yes, he did. Okay. So Mike did do that this morning. Cool. That's such good information. Matthew Paris, there's not a word bad enough to describe how garbage LG is. <laughs> I'm waiting for it to become officially a synonym in the dictionary. Oh my word. So bad. So bad. Um, Jeremy Kirkwood. Hey Matt. Hey, good morning, Jeremy. Seeing a weird anomaly in my market. Okay. Sellers who recently purchased a single family home at too high of a cost and are marketing it as a creative finance deals on MLS working some 0% creative deals right now. Love it. Interesting exit strategy in my opinion. That is it's interesting. I'm telling you, when the markets like this and things like that happen, it does create opportunity for those who are looking for inefficiencies in the market. All right. So I'm going to give you guys a real quick uh, two-minute soapbox. So if you have to go to the bathroom because you don't care what I'm going to say, go for it. Um, <clears throat> the quick two-minute soapbox is we were on the live stream on Thursday for Thanksgiving. I'm not going to call this person out because I don't disagree with their thought process. It's important that they went through the thought process. Apparently one person didn't care. They hung up. Um, but I love thought process. But here was, the, here was the statement that was made. Holy cow, the taxes in your state suck. I wouldn't want to do deals there. Okay. So I think California sucks. I think Mike is a freaking lion tamer stud, right? Mike is doing deals. One rental at a time is doing deals in Fresno in California. Guy's a rock star. I hate California's 
political structure. The reason that I hate it is because it's very largely speaking anti-landlord and there's a lot of landlords that got really hurt by this last round. So the reason I say all that is to say this, our job as investors is to find inefficiencies in the markets that we're interested in. Those inefficiencies are what lead to ridiculous profits. That's how it works. You have to figure out your market, what's going on in your market, much like Jeremy's talking about right here. He's seeing an anomaly. He's seeing something different. He's seeing something weird. What's awesome about that is he's identified that this is an opportunity. For me and for my state, the last five deals, and I'll challenge any of you to list the last five deals that you've done in the return. The last five deals return for me on my last five deals, the return on capital, the yield, is 23 to 20 to 43%. Show me your last five. I bet they're not that high. The whole reason I got those numbers is because I'm really good at what I do, but I understand in our market what is happening. So I'm targeting certain properties that are giving me these massive yields. I have not bought a single family home in at least two years that I wasn't flipping. I have not bought a single family home for investment in probably four or five years. It's been years since I bought a single family home for investment. And now my entire portfolio, in the interest of not Ken McElroying you, I'm actually talking about what I know about. Single family homes in my market have been largely unaffordable. Um, Mike still buys them in Fresno because he has 46, 46 affordability index. Mine just hit nine and that was up from seven, which was up from four, which was up from one. So my market's becoming more affordable, but it's still really unaffordable. That means only 9% of buyers, 9% of buyers make more than the median price of a home in my market and can actually afford it. 9%. That's not a big number. So I will continue to not invest there. If the single family home number comes up into the 40s, guess who's going to be a buyer? Me. If I'm in the 40s, 50s, 60s, I will be buying single family homes. So long as my strategy on the duplexes, tries, and quads is not giving me a bigger return. So I am, I am a return hound. That's what I care about. I'm always after return. Um... That's what I do. I buy, I go out there and I try and acquire return. And largely speaking, very wealthy landlords, they don't like that game. They want to be, I'm buying a 10 unit, a 12 unit, a 15, a 20. I'm building a 12, I'm whatever. I don't want to be in that game. I'm small, I'm, I'm a big, uh, small fish, big pond there. Where I'm at, I'm a big fish, small pond. I'm buying, I'm one of the bigger buyers of dupes, tries, and quads in my area. That's where I want to be. I set the market. I tell you, I know for myself what it's worth and that's when I buy. So, um, so off the soapbox, quick three minutes on that, but that's why I'm so diligent with talking to you guys about the fact of, it's not about the big shiny new toy. It's not about as far as, you know, this, uh, you know, 15 unit building. It's not about that. It's really about acquiring cash flow. You're buying cash flow. That's what you're doing. That's what I do. I buy cash flow for what it's worth. All right, Matt Herbert, regarding appliances, two questions. Do you buy protection plans? Never. I will not buy a protection plan. If your product that you're selling me is such a piece of crap that I need to buy a protection plan for it and it's an expensive protection plan, no. Nope. Nope. That's the way I look at those. Um, number two, how do you track which appliances are where and what their ages are? That is an excellent, excellent question. So um, we are working on something internally, um, basically myself and my wife, um, where we, because we work, we're working, we're evaluating three different property management softwares. Right now we basically use QuickBooks on the, um, on the expenses side, but as you guys know, QuickBooks isn't really a property management software. So we're looking at multiple property management softwares, getting a feel for that, a feel for extensibility of the model, like how big the model can get and manage that cost-wise. Um, so that's what we're actually working on now. 
we're going to select that. What we do right now is it's just a spreadsheet. That's it. So nothing high tech. It's just a spreadsheet. Um, and that spreadsheet's a little bit behind because we did so much acquiring this year and we lost our property ma our property management person. Um, so that list got behind because we acquired a bunch of those properties expecting that that property manager and such was going to grow with us. Um, and it was going to be not an employee. It was going to be a 1099 that was that would still do some work elsewhere, but would work for us a decent amount of time. Um, and yeah, it just didn't work out. So that's the way it went. The way it went. So hopefully that answers your question, Matt. Um, Andrew P., morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, Crimson Knight, what would you recommend for relationships for small landlords? Love to do a kitchen with lead abatement for under 12000 Any remodel with a lead abatement is a cost killer. Yeah. So um, what you want to do is you want to, in New Hampshire, you want to take the course. Take the course yourself. There's a abbreviated course and then there's a longer course, which is like four or five days. So Crimson, because I know your situation, just take some time, do five days, do that course. And then you can actually bring some people in that you can do the work either by yourself or bring them in and just get them kind of the quick cert so they can do the work with you. Um, that's absolutely the way to do it. It will save you a fortune, it'll save you a fortune. Um, yeah, it'll save you a fortune. Yep. And the remodel in most, most of those places, you know, lead abatement, things like that. You're usually just talking window trim, window casing, um, baseboard, and doors, doors and door jams is usually, is usually what your issue is going to be. And that's just, honestly, you can do that by yourself with the right equipment, get certified, obviously. Um, and you might not even be able to, you might not even need to get certified if it's your own stuff that, that I would check on. Um, but yeah, I would just do it. I would do it yourself. Cause then you can have somebody else come in and do all the other stuff. But, um, if you just get rid of the stuff that has lead in it, which is usually doors, trim, baseboard, and window, window treatments, um, unless the windows are old and painted, and then then those would need to be done too. But then in that particular case, I would still probably do the removal of the windows, but I would have somebody else come in and measure them, or measure them yourself if you know how to do it. Measure the windows. I'd probably have somebody else come in and measure them for me and say, I'm going to give you the window job, but you're going to show up and all the windows are going to be out and gone. So the only thing that you're going to need to do, the only thing you're going to need to do is put the new window in the hole, a replacement window, and then trim it out. That's it. <clears throat> and then, you know, do the insulation around it type of thing. That's what I would do. That's what I've done. That's how to keep the costs much, 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 much lower. Watch uh, Mike Hackleman. Hey, Mike, thanks for joining. Uh, I've not seen your name before, so I'm excited that you're here. Uh, what's your preferred method to get a solid handle on rental rates in a given market? That is an awesome question. Um, I know my market inside and out, so I know exactly what stuff is worth. If, you're, if you don't, you should. Um, but the places to look for that data are... I always use housing as a base, housing authority as a base, like venture or uh, voucher and section eight. I use that number as a base and I work my way up from there. Um, I look at Craigslist because that's stuff that's on market that's trying to be rented, number one. And I just track that over, you know, I kind of, I'm, I'm out on Craigslist probably once a week just for 10 minutes, taking a look at what's available for rent in my towns um, and how I compare to that. And especially if I have a unit coming and then if that unit's gone the next week when I go to post my unit or in two weeks when I go to post my unit, I know that that wasn't too much. Um, I just did that on a property and I got 15% more than I thought I was going to. It was a great plan for me as a little bit of work. Um, so yeah, that's what I would do. 
That's what I would do. That, that's going to give you rental meter is decent, but it's behind um, pretty much everything else behind Zillow's behind. They're not a rental company. Um, there are rentals on there available, but they're not, I, I don't use their number. Um, so yeah, I would do Craigslist apartments.com. I would look at Zillow and see what's rented. Um, I would also just have kind of a couple property managers as well. That's what I would do. I'm not, uh, that you call, not, have them work for you. Um, but a property manager, Hey, I've got a couple of units coming available. You know, what, what are, what are typically the rents that, that you guys would charge for those? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking for a property manager right now. Um, but as I look in the future, I want to just understand how you guys evaluate properties like that. So that's what I would do. That's what I would do. Uh, and that's what I do all the time. I use Craigslist religiously for that because that's where I post. That's where I get probably 90% of my tenants is Craigslist. It's phenomenal. Um, it's the demographic I'm going after, which is that, you know, 20s, 30s somethings, uh, 40s somethings. Um, I don't discriminate. I'll house anybody um, that qualifies. But that's where I find that demographic to be. And they're usually because they're, they've just left a place that they're usually renting. They're looking for another place that they're renting. They usually have a pretty good touch and feel um, for what the pricing is going for. Um, yeah, that's what I do. Hopefully that's helpful. But yeah, Mike, thanks for being here. Um, Andrew P., I just got a good chuckle out of that comment. If you knew what a libertarian was, you know I wouldn't care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It offended people. I saw literally like 10 people drop off the live cast like that. Whatever. I'm here for you guys. If you think I'm fun, cool. If you don't think I'm fun and my val my information is invaluable, no problem. No problem. Just watch from my face. I might buy the complex that you're renting in. Scott Coleman, Lumberjack, this porcupine is with you. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate that. Scott, I've seen your name a few times in the last few weeks. I appreciate you, my man. I like your comments. They're good. Price and pride. Do you find older landlords staying below market rent to keep housing affordable for their fam for families? Um, not altruistically. Not altruistically. It's because they're lazy. They're lazy. They're lazy. If you're twenty percent under market, you stay twenty percent under market because the tenant doesn't bother you. Um, they're nice. There, you don't mind them. Um, ooh, that was a big offensive comment. Seven people just drop. All good. Um, yeah, it's it's much more laziness than it is anything else. Um, they're looking for that perfect strike between um, effort and income. For me, I do that as well. If I have a tenant who's a pain in my ass. I have zero issue whatsoever letting them know at the end of the year I'm raising their rent. I have some tenants that are literally never contact me. And even with the market being what it was, I reached out to them. It was a nominal increase. It wasn't a big one. Man, that was a fast jump. I mean, that one bad joke, I, what clearly five people deemed as a bad joke. I thought it was funny. Um, so yeah, I, I do not find price and pride. I do not find that they're doing altruistically. They are not. They are doing it for that, uh, what I call the bullshit to money ratio. Money can be here, right? But, and bullshit can be right here. But if bullshit goes to here and money's still right here, <clears throat> goes to poo-poo. So yeah, that's the BS to money ratio. So I always look for the BS to be here, ideally here, but it's usually here. And then I just have to create the money ratio being high enough for the balance. And then in a property, sometimes the BS starts here and then you just have to wean it down over time. Cause it's usually a combination of the, there was a bad landlord that, that was there before um, and the building needs a bunch of work or sometimes there are bad tenants. I have one absolutely horrible tenant right now that tried to sue me, didn't pay during all of COVID um, then finally got relief and just has been a nightmare. I've lost two other tenants in the same building because of them. And this last week I finally got a writ of possession and now they're begging me to stay. No, no way. No way. 
No way. I'll see you at the sheriff. Yeah. Yep. And no, I won't have you pack. Yeah. Ridiculous. Nope. Nope. So yeah, pride and price. Yeah. I don't think it's, it's definitely not a function of their altruism. It's only a function of uh, BS to money ratio. And for me, um, people can get in the habit, right? And what they don't understand is taxes went up, water went up, sewer went up. All of my expenses for doing anything across the board went up. All of my contractors, they're all more money this year. That's fine. Free market economy. I am all about it, but I get my side too. So yeah, they are. I would love for an older landlord to tell me that they are doing it solely because they're trying to keep it available, avail, affordable for families. No way. Nope. Because if they had, if they had somebody walk up to them and say, "We can pay you thirty percent more," and we'll just wait, you can give them as much time as they need to to leave. He would take that money in a second. They would take that money in a second. So yeah, I don't believe that. Jennifer Medina. Jennifer, I've seen you a lot recently. I am so excited you're here. You, I've seen a lot. You've asked some really good questions. Uh, so Jennifer, good morning. Thank you for giving us your time. Absolutely. And advice from experience. Happy to do it. I hope you and your family had a good Thanksgiving. We did. Sending thoughts and prayers for your daughter. Thank you very much. I hadn't even read your statement before I said you were nice. So just thank you for proving my point. Um, yeah, my daughter's doing great. We're doing great. We're doing great. Just one day at a time. Um, and uh, yeah, it was so much fun. Uh, Thanksgiving, having uh, all three of my kids here with my wife. It was just, it was a blast because, um, and not having the phone ring because we self manage. So the only time a tenant calls you on Thanksgiving is if something blew up. <laughs> Thankfully, we didn't have any of those. So it was good. Uh, it was good. Uh, so yeah, thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate you. Uh, Death Angel PR2. Um, are banks still considering? Yes. Still considering 40 year loans? Absolutely. There are some programs that are out there now today. How can I join the Three Amigos group? So all you have to do is, great question. So to join the Three Amigos group, um, just look it up online, see it, and then send in the request. And then um, if you hit, if you request, we will accept. We're not trying to be exclusionary. We're just trying to make sure that, um, you know, people that are coming in are there to to learn and to share their experiences. We like people sharing their experiences too. That's how we learn. Mike still learns. I still learn. Dion still learns. Yeah, we all still learn. Um, Rob, so part of the strategy on my duplex in San Diego, yep, is to value add two ADUs in the back. Ooh, that's ambitious. Um, am I better off starting that now or wait for supply chain to stabilize? Um, depends on what the rules are in your area. Um, some places after they, so some places it will take six months to get that ADU even approved. And then once that's approved, you have two years, federally you have two years. Some states have only one, make it only one year, but usually it will take you six months to even get that approved. Then you are going to be two years before you can start building or up to two years that you have to start building within that two years. So me, my, my take on it, I is actually, I actually have one that I'm working on. I got all of the surveying done. All the work has been completely finished. The only thing I haven't done is put it in front of the town yet because our town has a one year rule. So I don't want to get approved December or January and then have to build it by next and have to have you know, started building next year. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to do that. We're too busy right now. I've got too much other stuff going on. So I've got all of the drawings done. I've got all of the survey work done. I'm 10 grand out of pocket on this project already. 10 grand. Um, and that's with no town approvals. That's just to make sure that when we go to the town, we have all the information there. It's solely that. So my advice to you is, um, is yeah. Yeah. My advice to you is that is I would understand what your rules are in your town um, but I would likely start the process. It also spreads out your dollars. If it is a two year on the back side of the ADU, it will, you can start your process. Now you'll probably be five, seven, 10,000 bucks into it by the time the six months is over, maybe even a little bit more. Um, but then you have your plan and then you have two years to start building from there. That's going to be a value because if something shifts in the market changes, 
You can A, always go back through the process because it was proved once before. That's a much less expensive process. Um, but if the market, let's say there is deflation next year, let's say the market does tank, um, then that's the opportunity to buy and do work because you'll have contractors with nothing to do. You'll have inventory at these different places. And so the supply chain can shift. The thing that I'm always looking to do is be a couple steps ahead of what the market's doing so I can navigate and basically play my best, what I call Geppetto. I'm Geppetto with the, with the, uh, with the puppet. I'm Geppetto. So I want to, well, that's what I aim to be as Geppetto is working and moving those pieces and parts um, to make sure that I'm doing it when it costs the least amount of money. Um, and when I can help out families that need work, um, where they say, Hey, my old rate was $45. I'm now willing to do it for 25 an hour. Boom. Done. Cool. Awesome. Come on down. And you can only be in that position if you've done all that work. So that's what I would do. Um, Karen Molner. Thank you, Matt. Needing to hear this. Today. I'm very glad, Karen. I'm glad this is helpful. If you have a specific question, I'm happy to answer that too. I'm glad it's helpful. Crimson Knight 921. I was talking about my life choices. Oh, <laughs> the amount of time I spent gaming in the past and still to this day, now that the germs are winding down, winding down, trying not to go to a lot of conventions this year. Yeah. So I think it's, I totally get that. Totally, totally get that. Um, you know, we all have that choice. You spend your time. Uh, the way that I look at time is not spending it, but investing it. I invest my time in things that I expect to return on my time. Um, I invest time in my kids because I'm expecting a return on that. Um, the return that I'm expecting is for them to be good people. I'm expecting them to be productive and I'm expecting them to do their part. And so I invest my time in them because I want them to know that they're loved and I want them to be successful. Um, and I want them to contribute to society and be a net add to society. So that's where I'm in. Uh, um, that's where I'm investing. That's why I invest my time. So I never look at time being spent. I look at time being invested. Um, and so that's where I'm, my focus is, is investing in my investing my time. And that's investing in real estate, investing in relationships that I believe are valuable, um, which are my kids and my wife and my, and my good, my friends. Um, and then I have business time investments. Uh, and then I have my properties. I invest time in my properties because I expect a rate of return. If you ex if you want a relationship to go bad, don't invest time in it. Don't invest energy in it. And it's the same thing with a rental property. If you want your property to go to crap, don't invest time in it. Don't invest money in it, making it better. Um, so, you know, that's my quick 120 seconds on that is, uh, yeah, I'm all about investing my time. And so Crimson, that's the cool thing. You are complete control of that. And so it's not ever to say cut them out unless they're negative in your life, right? But it's to say, okay, I need to make, I need to pick, I need to pick. The other thing too is, is that um, I'm a big Vegas guy. If you guys don't know, I love to go to Vegas. I'm not a huge gambler, but I do like to gamble. Um, but I look at that again as not investing my money. I look at that as investing in a good time. And just so long as there's not, not just so long as that time wasn't super expensive, we're good. Um, but I like to, you know, spend money or invest money in great food. Um, if you guys couldn't tell. So um, I like to invest money in a good meal. I like to spend that time with my wife um, and where we really get to just spend time with each other. Um and so that's a, that's a blast. Um, so yeah. So to that point on Vegas, I would go there. I would, you know, if I did a couple big deals and, you know, or I closed like a burr house or something like that, or if I closed like a big deal, um, if I closed like this big, huge, massive deal and it was just a absolute windfall. Yeah. I'd talk to my buddies and say, or talk to Ashley on my wife and say, let's go to Vegas. Let's go to Vegas for a weekend. When we didn't have kids, that was really easy. Now that we have kids, less easy. Um, but yeah, we would just do, you know, and we would then have a budget because we would take a portion of that and invest it in our relationship and our time and time together. Um, I'm not going to be one of those guys that, you know, so I've been married for um, 
this coming June is uh, 15 years. Um, and I've been with my wife for 17 years. Um, and so, yeah, I've been with my wife a long time. And so love her to death and so blessed to have her and the family that we have. So we invest time in that. So, all right, off the soapbox. Uh, Beverly Ho, how did you know when to transition from doing rental repair work yourself because you enjoy it versus hiring it out? Thanks for all the time, Ho. Beverly, that's an awesome question. I've seen your name a couple of times. I'm super excited that you're with us today. Um, so, um, when, when I could afford to do it. So I did it out of more of necessity. I was okay at it. Um, I knew a better job could be, be done no matter how much time I spent. I knew a better job could be done. Um, and so we've gone back and remodeled some of those houses since. Yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah. So, um, the other tough thing is too, like on the three amigos group, I saw somebody post that, Hey, it cost me, you know, 200 bucks a foot or whatever to build this house. But then he admitted to doing all the finish work, dude, like then no one else can hit that number because you did all the finish work and being a guy who does a lot of finish work, um, in my houses that I redo as projects, that's usually the biggest bill. That's usually the biggest bill. Um, it's bigger than floors. It's the only thing that might, uh, yeah, it's bigger than electrical. The only time it's not bigger than plumbing is when we need a new heating system. So that's usually one of the biggest bills. So, mm, yeah, that's my, that's my take. So, um, so to really answer your question, it was, um, yeah, it, it was really, I wanted to get out of it as quickly as I could. I enjoyed certain things of it, but um, my time, the skill that I created was finding good, finding good or great deals. Uh, it was actually finding great deals, finding great deals. And then I, my goal was to be an elite investor. And I think that's what I am now. I think I'm an elite investor, um, of residential real estate. I'm an elite investor, um, 20 to 43% returns. Yeah. Yeah. Most people aren't going to touch those numbers and not consistently five deals in a row. Right. So, and there's a difference in people that play this game. So I always liken it to sports, right? I want to be the Michael Jordan of, you know, small unit investing. That's what I want to be. Um, Mike is that I think on single family homes and he owns a lot of stuff that's bigger, but on single family stuff, he's elite. He is elite. And I think he's elite kind of across the board, but I think that that's his, that's like, he's like, he's so good at it. He can teach it and teach it well. Um, that's what I think. And I think on, on self-management, I think the things that Dion does in a unit, I think I like a lot. Um, and I've got my own process, but I think I'm a lead at this point. Cause I look at return. I look at how much money gets to the bottom line and the fact that I'm not constantly rolling tenants because that can be a real painful process. So, um, hopefully that answers the question, Beverly, is that it really came down to, um, having the money to be able to do it having the money to be able to do it. Cause you got to remember I lived through the crash. So I had to do pretty much all my own work in the crash because I could find people to do it, but I couldn't afford it. So because <clears throat> people stop paying rent. So Jeremy Kirkwood. Thanks, Matt. Inefficiency is correct. Yep. I even had a seller tell me they paid too much. It's essentially going to turn the full amortization of a 200 K house over 20 year from 382 at a low rate to 200 K. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That's exactly it. Inefficiency in markets, guys. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for inefficiencies in markets, inefficiencies. Um, that's where when you understand the market and you understand the numbers, I know more than 99.9% .9 of real estate agents out there and the ones that know more than me, <clears throat> um, are landlords of my size. Those are the only ones that, I mean, a regular agent just doesn't because they don't work that way. Um, and that's fine. But yeah, that's kind of the, that's kind of the deal. So yeah, great. That's, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, Jeremy, that's a, exactly you're right. Flat win-win. I 100% agree with you. Totally agree. That's awesome. Yeah, Jeremy's doing the work. So Jeremy's goal is 22 deals in 2022. 
And when he bet me to, or when he asked me if I would shave my beard, if he got there, I knew he had a bunch of deals in the hopper. And then he came, came, came through and was honest that he has eight in the hopper, which is why I said no. Cause I knew he was sandbagging me. Um, and again, the number that we're looking for is not necessarily the number of deals that are acquired. The number that we're really looking for is how you acquired them and the return on capital that it gives you. That's what matters. Um, if you're telling me that you're going to do 22 deals that are seller financed. Yeah. Yeah. That's hot. That's hot. or even sub two, 22 sub two deals. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. That's really awesome. Especially with what rates are now. That's really awesome. Um, if you're telling me you're going to go pay retail on 22 homes, not impressed. Anybody can do that. Anybody with a lot of money can do that. Um, G G E G E op G op one forty seven. I've not seen you in the name before. So thanks for being here with us. I'm hanging insulation while you're listening. <laughs> Perfect. That's my favorite response, by the way, is people that are working and they're just listening to me while they're working. I love it. I love it. Cause that's so was me. I was in that totally before quarantine, I would still throw mic on or something like that. Mike was a little bit difficult because of these 15 minute segments and all the ads that pop up. <laughs> I won't lie. So I would love finding something that was either live cast or something that was a couple of hours and just click in my ear and then doing the work. Yeah, I dig it. I dig it. Um, just wanted to say thank you for all your videos. You're very welcome. I own a three and a five unit in Rochester. Very cool. High prices caused me to drag my feet this year on another property. Yeah, dude, I get it. So Rochester is in around my area. I refuse to go there. Um, I really am focused on my three markets, but it's, it's in my County. Um, and so good for you, man, three and five unit. That's fantastic. Um, you, those are enough to get wealthy on just by themselves. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, your market exploded value wise and the rents have gone up a lot, but they've not gone up nearly as much as the values have. So I think it's going to be a matter of some time. Um, but yeah. Uh, you sold your alligator in Farmington four unit last year. I need to get to work and get into that, into another property. Thanks again, George Philbrook. Yeah, George, thanks so much. Thanks so much for being here. I love that story. Um, yeah, Farmington's tough. So Farmington is the very northmost part of our county. Completely different market. Completely different market. That's a tough market. Um, so George, you're very welcome. If you're still watching, I'd love to hear if um, if you ever looked at doing housing, um, housing authority, Section 8 voucher in that building. I'm very interested in that. So, cool. John Williams, how do you calculate the BSIRR, initial rate of return? Is that the one you're talking about? I don't even bother calculating it. I don't because I that's not how I look at any of my stuff. Um. No, never look at any of my stuff based on IRR. Nope. Because everything for me is a long-term investment. So, um, yeah. So I, that's something that, that's something that, a cal that's a calculation I'm aware of. Um, but not something that I do. It's the same thing as doors. So somebody asked in the three amigos group, um, about doors, you know, uh, income per door. Don't know. Don't care. Don't know. That's a flex number. Um, I think Beth, if Beth's watching, uh, Beth actually said it was a flex number too. I agree. Totally agree with her. Um, it's a flex number. I have this many doors and this is my average price per door. Don't care. Don't care. I have some units that are $2,000 a door. Does that matter? No. If I have something that's a negative 500. So it really comes down to the property specifically, I'm only looking at one thing and that's the cash flow that it creates on my capital. I'm looking as an investor, I'm investing money. If I'm investing, you know, whatever the number is 20 grand, I want to see what my rate of return on that 20 grand is. What's my return on that capital? Am I going to make 500 bucks a month on that property? So my rate of return, you know, is $6,000. Um, there's something else to IRR that they calculate, which is why I didn't use it. I can't remember what it was though. It's been so long. Um, I purely look at the, my return on my capital. So, um, and recognizing, yeah, I just, like I said, I'm, I could be getting something wrong on IRR because it's been that long since I've looked at it. So I only look at um, 
my my rate of return period, not my initial rate of return. I only look at my rate of return period. Um, and recognize it's probably going to, in that first year that I own it, that I'm probably going to have some higher costs because I will probably fix some things the other landlord didn't with cash. Um, and then I'm into the deal a little bit more year one. Um, and then after that, it's, you know, the rate of return is crazy good, right? So, um, yeah. So my initial rate of return, I care less about. I care more about my over my overall. Um, Evolve Properties LLC been waiting to hear the update on the Lambo house deal. So the update is I have a PNS on a property that is going to be the Lambo deal. I do. I do. Um, we are supposed to close um, sometime this month. Sorry, sometime next month, December. Um, but yeah. I have a, mm -hmm. yep, I have a Lambo deal. Oh, so excited. Yeah, have a Lambo deal. Yep, yes, yes, yes. Um, and for those of you who are wondering what Evolve is talking about, Evolve Properties, LLC, um, if you're wondering what they're talking about, um, they are talking about a deal that I said, because I'm such a cheap ass, that I would buy a Lamborghini because I want a Lamborghini. That's a, that's a, Life, I, yeah, since I, since I was a kid, yeah, I want a Lamborghini. Um, so that's something I can make happen now and it not affect my lifestyle. Um, but the reason that it won't affect my lifestyle is because I said that I would buy a house, do whatever work needed to be done to it, then get the rents and have my return on cash over what the, over what the mortgage is, that space the profit that the profit the true net profit that i make on that property every month has to be enough to pay my lamborghini payment so i am literally going to do a house that i buy rent out and the sole purpose of that house is to be my lamborghini house that's what it will be called in my portfolio it will be called the lambo house because the sole goal of buying that property is to have enough return on it and no funny business with like 50% down loan to make that magic happen. No, no, no. Standard investor loan, 20% down or 25% down, depending on which bank I use, but standard 20, 25% down, which I have to do on all of my deals that has to create enough money at the end of the month that it pays my Lambo payment. That's the goal. We'll see if I can make it happen. I think I can. I think with this property, I think this one, yeah. Yep. Yep. That's what I think the opportunity is. Um, Matt Herbert, what is the Three Amigos Group? So the Three Amigos Group, dude, you're all good. All good, Matt. Um, the Three Amigos Group is uh, the, the, the Three Amigos of FI, of FI. Uh, FI stands for Financial Independence. The three amigos of FI on Facebook, send a request. I'll approve it. Or Dion will approve it. We're both admin in the group. So we'll approve it. Um, but, uh, Rob, define finish work. Any For me, my definition is um, truly finish. So past, you know, so I'm talking uh, window trim. I'm talking window casing. I'm talking basically anything that you're using, you know, mill work. That's finished work to me. That's finished work to me. It's all, so it's all, I would say pretty much anything you would do with a chop saw is what I would say. Um, but yeah, <clears throat> baseboard, doors, cased opening, windows. Um, that's what I would call finished work, Rob. <clears throat> um, Crimson Knight, do you think 20 bucks an hour for cheap labor is a good price? I do. Trying to fill in lines of wood panels with drywall, which is tedious. It is. I make thirty-five dollars an hour after taxes at my job, so I believe it's worth it. Worth it to pass it on. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. I would even try a couple people from like uh, Craigslist or something like that. I've done. I've hired people off of Craigslist before, where I've just said, "Hey, this is what the job is." Um, had them show up and give me a quote or any any of those number of things. But yeah. Yep. Yep. I've I've used people off of Craigslist for sure to do stuff like that. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Uh, Nathaniel Martin, 
First time being here. Hello from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Daniel, so awesome that you're here. I love seeing new faces and, and new names. It's awesome. Um, just we're here to make an impact and help people and answer questions they have about real estate investing. So happy to happy to have you here from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Incidentally, I've been to Milwaukee, Wisconsin a number of times, specifically to the Baird building. Mm -hmm. Lots of times. And I've done the drive from Chicago up to Milwaukee a number of those times. Um, and the A&W, I don't remember what the highway is, but the A&W is, we don't have those in the East Coast. And so the A&W is a religious experience for me. I love it. I enjoy it when I would take that trip from Chicago to Milwaukee, incidentally. Um, Eli Kohler, pay the, pay the YouTube premium 12 bucks a month. It'll change your life with no ads. Yes. I'm so cheap. I probably will. That's a good idea. Yep. That's a good idea. Uh, Matt Herbert, how much do you keep in reserves or more importantly, how do you calculate that number? So Matt Herbert, great question. Um, for me, so I, as far as reserves that I never touch, um, I think it's like, it's less for me. It's not very much. Um, the reason why is because of cash flow. So how much we cash flow on a monthly basis is enough for a down payment, probably on a duplex. So if I have that much cash flow coming in on a monthly basis, I don't need to have a massive reserves, right? If there was a massive like Chicago style fire, right? Um, and a bunch of my properties went up. Well, then that would be a little bit of a different issue. But again, not much of an issue because it would take time to work out with insurance. Insurance pays a year worth of lost rents. Um, but my, I have a higher, I do a higher deductible on my insurance because I believe insurance is what insurance is for, which is for mass loss, not for tweener stuff. Um, so I use, I use in my insurance, I believe the best way that insurance can be used. Um, so in that particular case, just based on cash flow in the other units, um, yeah, like it's impossible to keep the same percentage of when you're two than of when you're 32. So we're at 30, 32 or 33 buildings, um, 90, 90 something units, 90 ish units. So yeah, for us, it's, it's not, it's not huge, but we also have just cash. We, we just have cash, right? because we have the cash flow and we don't spend it all the time. So yeah, so it's a little bit different. Um, when you get to that kind of number, you see that cash flow on a monthly basis. Um, I think across the board, I think if 60%, 70%, no, 60, if 60% of our tenants I think it's like a 60% of our tenants pay, then we are able to make our nut because of the age of a lot of our properties, meaning how long we've owned them and the profit that's there. Uh, sorry, I just saw John Williams comment. Yeah. <laughs> it's a joke about BS ratio, the BS ratio. Yeah. Yeah. What I love is... Um, so I always say it's just math. It is. It's just math to me, right? It's really, really simple math. I put X in the bucket. Out of that bucket, I would expect this much back. Like, it's really, you just have to find out what your area is. Is it a 6% area, an 8% area, a 2% area? If it's 2, I look for a different market. If it's 6, I consider it. For me... I want to be, I'm double digits. Those are the, that's why we grew slowly is because of double digits. So I could have done 10 deals in a year, but I wasn't getting double digit returns. I will only do deals that give me double digit returns. So because I would only do deals that did me double, that I would could do double digit returns on, I had 
to I wasn't doing that many deals. I would deal, again, the reason that we have as many units as we do is because we've been doing this as long as we have. There's no replacement for time in the market, guys. There's no replacement for that. I have 32 buildings ish. Um, but I have 32 buildings. I've been doing this for 20 years. So we acquired, you know, one here, one here, one here. And then it was, okay, now we can do a couple this year. And then it was a couple the next year. And then it was three. And then it was back down to one. And then it was two. And then it was one. Um, and so all of those numbers flexed for the first 13 years I was investing I could really only do one a year because I was trying to get in there with owner rock money. So that's what, that's what was the driver for me was the one a year was trying to get in there with driving with, with that money. Um, so yeah, that's what I would do. Um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, George, I, uh, G up one forty seven. So George, I have a few housing and S8 tenants. Okay. I actually purchased the three and the eight vacant on the same day. Good for you. Wow. Both were built in 1997 and originally low income housing for tax credits. Good for you. That's a great deal. The Farmington four unit was a money pit with equity. So I cashed out. Yeah. Yeah. Cause sometimes, yeah, that can be tough. That can be really tough. I get it. Yeah. Like before I go to sell a multifamily, I'm looking at, any way I can make the thing work because I, I know that 10 years from now it's going to be worth more money. Um, so yeah, it, but, but I get it. I cashed out of a couple properties where I was out of the area. I didn't want to be in that area anymore. So I cashed out of both of them. Um, I took the cash and I reinvested it right away into my market. So, cause that I shifted markets. So yeah, totally agree with you. Matt Herbert, do you include closing costs as part of your ROC or cash on cash calculation? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Yep. You have to. Yep, you have to. Yep, that whole number goes in. Yep, the whole number goes in. Yep. I do, I do. Uh, Chester Williams, finance nerd here. Love it. IRR works the same way as net present value, but is more for internal budgeting projects and where to deploy capital for maximum ROI. It compares investment projects to each other. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, I think I looked at that because um, cause the math, the, I didn't agree with the math. Um, you know, they say like, because that was also looking at like a kitchen costing X. I do my kitchens for half the price that anyone else can do them for. Um, same thing with pretty much any project in a house, uh, electrical. You know, most people will pay their electricians 100 bucks an hour or 80 bucks an hour. Um, I pay guys that, have their master's licenses that want to hustle on the weekends. I pay them. We agree that there's value to them at being a 1099. There's value to me at, at having them do that work as a 1099 um, as opposed to them doing their W2 job. So they do that on the weekends or nights or things like that. And I pay a commiserate rate. I pay a much less than their company rate. Right. And I'm not stealing guys that work for companies that I've done work with in the past. I don't do that. Um, but, but yeah, so I can do stuff much less money. It's works for them because they know they get paid the day they're finished. It works for me and where my project might take a little bit longer, but, um, but I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. That's a good trade off for me. John Williams. Sorry. BS yield. Yep. It was a joke. BS ratio. Yep. The BS ratio. Yeah. Yeah. It's formulas i like the real math on a deal looking specifically at a deal and figuring out all the math and saying you know 30,000 bucks with down payment and closing costs another 15,000 bucks in get ready money which is what mike calls it too uh, or make ready money make rent rent, rent ready rent money um, and then just taking that overall number 45,000 bucks let's say in this particular case and then saying okay i'm going to make you know uh, 10,000 bucks this year on that so it's a 20% return on capital so I, that's, that's where I like the actual hard numbers. Um, formulas, largely speaking, um, ask Zillow how well algorithms went for them. Idiots. Idiots. When that happened, Mike and I did an interview that day, and I said the most important thing, I was waiting for the phone call. I was waiting for them to call me and tap me on the shoulder to be the CEO because 
I could have fixed that problem for them. They wouldn't have lost $500 million had I been the CEO of that company. I would have had that portfolio making them money, making them money. They didn't do the right thing. That CEO should be fired. He's horrible. He's garbage on a stick. Yeah. Matthew Paris. That's me every Sunday, but you kill my production because I'm always active in the chat. <laughs> yeah. I get that. I get that. Yep. I love working, listening to stuff on the side, love working, doing that stuff. I like it. This is my lumberjack garb. I'm ready. I was very excited to see the weather turn. Still shorts, but a flannel, a flannel and shorts. Um, Chester Williams, uh, Matt, he, Matt, yep. So message for Matt. Yep. Acquisition costs should include all forms of cash out. That's exactly right. Down payment, closing, and cost to make units ready. Yep. Chester, finance nerdery. Love it. Love it. That's exactly what has to happen, my man. Yep. Rob, later. Got a jet. No worries, Rob. Have fun. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, Chester's 100% correct. That is how you calculate. So, my numbers, how I calculate uh, a deal is I literally look at one thing and one thing only, which is all the money I'm out of pocket versus what my – and and what – my, as part of that equation, all my money out of pocket and what my return on that capital is going to be, period. I don't project or pro forma rents like lousy real estate agents do to make the number completely fake and crap. Um, I It's what it is right then and there. The only thing that I'll ever account for, the only thing is if I'm looking at a deal where it seems expensive because the four units are so woefully underpriced, but I know the day that I get them up higher. I know the day, I know the day that I get them, I can make, I will make them higher. Um, I just got a call on a deal and they were doing two bedrooms for like 700 bucks. Oh, the person's been there for 12 years. Yeah. No, no kidding. I'd be there for that long too. Yeah. I, I mean, duh. Like that's less than half market. Less than half market. Less than half market is why the building needs a bunch of work. So I know on that deal, and here's the funny thing was, I calculated the numbers on that deal. I was still happy buying that deal for what I bought that deal for. But in adding what market is going to be on those units, it makes my, I'm buying that deal at a over 20% return. When I'm finished, it's going to have a high thirties return. So yeah. Yep. 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 hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, dude, that's awesome. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Count all those things. That's important. Um, you know, but don't make the promise to yourself of future rents. That's not how it works. It's just not how it works. But it is important to understand when you're buying. So my, one of the things of my focus is buying value. And buying value really comes down to really only one exercise. If rent, you know, largely speaking, people can pick up on Okay, rents are this, property's worth this based on this is my this is my you know this is my return, right? That's what the spreadsheet does, right? Where you can get next level and on your way to elite is understanding that is 23% under market. You've seen the unit, you've seen the quality. You know that you can get that because you have other units that you're getting that even in that area, right? That's where that's where you get elite. Don't expect that turn to be fast though. That turn is going to be probably a minimum of a year. Cause even if their lease is up in six months, then you're putting, you know, 10,000 bucks into the unit to, to get your most. I had a unit that last year rented for, uh, $900. So 900. Yeah. $900. It rented for last year. I went in, I did about 4,000 bucks worth of work 
flooring, painting, um, new washer dryer, um, smaller unit, uh, studio actually. Um, and it went, it was 900 bucks. It just rented for 1,750. 1,750. Yep. Almost doubled. Rent was up almost a hundred percent on that unit. So I spent the money because I knew I could get that much higher of a rent in that area. That area exploded. Absolutely exploded. There were properties in that area that, um, they had this old house close by that they knocked down. They put condos, those condos, two bed and three bed condos sold for over 400. So that helped turn the class of the neighborhood into that. So I could get that big, fat, crazy number that I love. So yeah, 1750 numbers. Great. Numbers crazy. And the thing to keep in mind was I was hitting my returns. I was hitting my you know, rates on 900 and now I doubled. So that 900 or 850 basically goes all the bottom line. Just absolutely killer. Absolutely killer. Um, Chester Williams, Zillow is an unmitigated disaster for, for its foolishness. They should have become a landlord. Yep. It's exactly what I said the day that it happened. I would take that CEO spot and I would instantly contact some of the largest uh, companies in the country. I would have done either a joint venture with them, or I would have said, I've got all this staff now. They are large. It's a bunch of agents. I'm going to just transition it and I'm going to, I have all the data, right? Cause I'm Zillow. I have all the data of what these things rent out for. And for now, I'm just going to rent these properties out. The return on their capital would have been ridiculous. And they would have completely, completely missed a $500 million loss. I don't care if you have 4.6 billion on the balance sheet. You literally lit on fire half a billion dollars. That CEO should be tarred and feathered. Right? Unreal. Anyway, so yeah, I agree. I said that the day it happened, I would have taken that job and I would have given Zillow its most profitable quarters it's ever seen. Yep. I mean, at the end of the day, it was only um, 16 or 18,000 total homes. It's nothing. It's a. It's literally a day's inventory. They did a massive deal, I think, with Blackstone. Blackstone bought one of their portfolios, 2,000 homes. Dumb. Dumb. Who's smarter money, Blackstone or Zillow? Yeah, exactly. Rhetorical, I promise. Um, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, that's my feeling on that. Crimson Night 921. Weekend work is helpful. Yep. My tenant who is a master electrician works for 16 an hour. Perfect. That's exactly right. Yep. Exactly right. And those are the guys and 30 bucks an hour if I help him free learning. I 100%. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Even if you only ever learn how to just pull wire and, you know, get it to the boxes or even just are the ones that mount the boxes. And then the electrician can come in and he what's called devices, everything like devices, the, you know, the outlets and the switches and hooks into the panel and you just properly label everything for them. You can save a crap ton of money. And yeah, that's a technical term. You can save an absolute ton of money. You just have to make sure that your wire management works the way he wants it to work. So, um, but yeah, you can save a ton of money because they'll look at it and be just like, yeah, sure. That's like the worst part of the job. Getting the materials, shopping for the materials, running the stupid wire. That's like the worst. So if you can take all of that out and all they're doing is actually connecting and doing devicing. Yeah, no brainer. No brainer. Um, blah, 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 blah. Matt Herbert at Chester Williams. Yep, that is what I do, but I've always wondered if everybody else does that. Not everybody else does that. People that are trying to lie to themselves do not use all those numbers and they start hiding stuff. So yeah, yep, I don't, but people will to lie to themselves to show it's a greater return on paper than it is. So yeah. John Williams, you make me laugh almost daily. Oh, good. I'm glad. That's cool. Uh, glad I can make you laugh every once in a while. Absolutely. Yeah. I do this because I enjoy it. And yeah, you need a good laugh. Oh, my word. I'm really contemplating whether or not to share an email that I got from a tenant. Not this week. I got to think about it. It is quite honestly probably full of the 
most unbelievable amount of dumb things I've ever heard said by a tenant. She like took top first, probably first, third and seventh place in things, stupid things that were said in that email. It's like, what the hell? Really? Anywho. Yeah. I'll, I'll think about sharing that next week. Uh, blah, 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 hip hop one silver. Yep. What if you had 35 doors, but your accountant said, take the garbage out, keep 10 and buy better cash on cash with upward potential. So I had to take the garbage out. Um, so, um, the only thing that I take my accountant's advice on is accounting. <clears throat> um, but he would get a seat at the table. So if he said, take the garbage out, um, it depends on what you mean by properties uh, or garbage. Um, like, is it a garbage return? Uh, is it truly a crappy property? Like you spend a ton of money on it every year. Um, I find that some people make mistakes, like so on a car, right? When your car is like kind of dying on you and, and you know, you're, it comes, becomes like a money pit, but then you do brakes and rotors and, uh, you know, brake lines and tires and blah, 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 blah. But that fatigued you. And so now you sell it. I'm a buyer for that car. You just did all the maintenance I'm going to need done for the next two years. I'm a buyer of that car at that point, if it, unless it has like an engine tick. Um, so I'm a buyer at that point of that car, unless it's the same thing that's constantly going wrong every 90 days. I'm a buyer of that car. Um, so I think it's the same thing with houses. I, I think that sometimes it's a, a fresh perspective. It's all is all the building needs um, to give you a big, a big, huge boost and a big, huge return on capital. So I, depending on what he means by garbage, I'd love to hear more. Um, on what he meant by garbage. Again, get, get, if you can come and set me up some, some ground rules, um, I'll definitely give you an opinion. So um, we all have properties that aren't our best, um, but the goal is to get them up to level. And if, it, if you realize that for some reason that property is just never going to level up, yeah, then sure, you can sell it. But at that large of a percentage of your portfolio, I would doubt was that bad. That's my feeling. So, but yeah. Give me more details. I'll give you more input. Uh, Chester Williams, I'm glad you mentioned rents. I was looking into rent -a meter for area average rents, but those probably aren't providing accurate rent rates based on post COVID. No, they are not. Um, anything else accurately estimate rents? Craig, so Craigslist is what I look at. Um, that is the best place because I don't want estimates. Craigslist isn't monitored. These other things aren't monitored. Um, so I would not, uh, yeah, I would not, I, I would do the work myself. That's what I do. I do the work myself. So I look at Craigslist. I look at apartments.com. I'll look at Zillow. I'll take all of those average. I have a couple, uh, or not all of those average, but what kind of all of those are averaging in and of themselves and then kind of figure that out. Um, like I said, watching Craigslist for, you know, I watch Craigslist at least once a week for about, you know, look through it for just 10 minutes, just looking and seeing what units are out there for where I need to be competitively priced for when I'm putting my next market, my next unit out there. Uh, and then just judging it on myself. Yeah. Good area. Yeah. Bad area. Yeah. That number's nuts. Um, so I just do that work myself. I have my own, um, process, but that's my process. Um, I do not like, um, rent a meter. They're too far behind Zillow. I don't like it that much cause that's not, uh, you know, a guaranteed win. Um, and I have, rental agents that I've used for strategically for properties. Um, I'll call them. What do you think? Last thing in this area, what it rent for? Uh, and then they're able to give you that information. Um, but if it's quite frankly, if it's outside the last 90 days, I don't listen because the market's completely different, completely, completely different. Wow. I said something objectionable. 10 people dropped off like that. I didn't think it was that objectionable, but whatever. Um, so yeah, I agree with that Chester on the, uh, on the numbers. I would just do your own homework on, I would look on Craigslist. That's what I would look on. That's what I would do. Uh, Eli Colner average deals in my area cost over 150 K per project just to close. So rentals, so rentals end up being a store of capital instead of cash flowing. It's pretty painful. Yeah, that's brutal. Um, yeah, I would not be in that market. That is not a market for me. I am all about return on my capital. 
So I actually lived in a different part of my state in the areas that I was doing work in. The return on capital was not very good. Um, and so when I was looking to move, I looked for a market and then I moved to that market. That's what I did. I looked and I moved and I moved to that market. When I moved to that market, I did a ton of market research. I had the chance of moving to kind of any one of three different towns. None of our one, only one of which I do business in. I looked for feedback about the building inspector and code enforcement. Was he a good guy? Was he easy to work with? Was he reasonable? Um, that shut me off of one town instantly. Um, all the feedback that I heard was guys an asshole. No, thanks. I'm good. I want to build a business. I don't need to be working with that guy. If he, if everyone says, if everyone says he's that. So that was a pass. Um, and so, yeah, for, so for me, we moved about, um, about an hour, no 45 minutes, excuse me. We moved about 45 minutes to get to the market that I'm in now from where I was. But that market was about an hour from where I lived previously and I changed states. So I've moved, I've moved for a market and it was unbelievably worth it. And I wouldn't want to have done it far away at all because I lived through the crash. So I started buying property in the early 2000s, 2001, 2002, that time. So yeah, I've been doing this for about 20 years. Started young, but good. Um, blah, 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 blah. Jennifer Medina. Hey, Jennifer. Um, in the properties you acquire, what percentage of the units do you inherit tenants or do you try to avoid inheriting tenants? Jennifer, you, you ask really good questions all the time that are helpful to everybody. So really good. Love that question. Um, what percentage? So it depends. Um, I bought a lot of, the, I bought a lot of foreclosures in 11, 12 and 13 or 10, 11 and 12 or not, excuse me, nine, 10 and 11. I always forget those three years. 9, 10, and 11, and a little bit of 12, I bought foreclosures. So nobody living there. Um, largely speaking, I had to go into every single one and do projects and then get them rented, blah, blah, blah. Um, now I'd say it's probably every building that I buy has at least some tenants. There might be one empty unit. Like if it's a three or a four unit, there might be one empty unit. Um, if it's a duplex, I'm trying to think. So let's just go my last six deals. So last six, um, three out of four, four out of five, uh, one out of two, um, vacant. I know it's my last five. So one vacant. Yep, one vacant. All of them were at least partially lived in, which is my best, which is my ideal. If I'm buying a two, three, or four, or five, I want, um, ideally, I have 60 or 80% full um, because then I can redo the one unit if it needs redoing, which it almost always does because that's the one that no one's in anymore. That's the one that usually needs to be renovated. So then it gives me a chance to renovate. And then 30, 30 days later, I've got the place done and somebody moves in and now I've got a higher rent. And now the other ones start to come up for, okay, do we keep this tenant? Do we not keep this tenant? We always want to see how they behave, see how they are to work with, um, and then just make our judgments from there. We've staved off with, we actually in um, the beginning part of, so COVID in 2020, and when they had the moratorium in 21, we didn't do any rent raises. Or very few, very, very few, very few. On existing tenants. We weren't trying to make life more difficult. Um, since then, yes. Rent raises and the ones that were leases are expiring, we're going to be raising those too. Yep. Have to. All of our costs went up. So, yep. But yeah, really good question, Jennifer. As always. Karen Molnar. Matt, in the early years of real estate investing, where did you find your deals? MLS, driving for dollars. Also, what's your criteria for vetting tenants? Great question. Um, so yes, all my deals were MLS. Um, yes, I also drove for dollars, but I didn't get, I, that was more like, uh, dreaming. I would send some letters, um, 
for a, there was a lot of inventory for quite a while with the crash. Um, now, now I, now I get brought deals a lot. Um, wholesalers, pocket listings, um, owners of buildings that are close to me that they know that I own the place. Um, so now it's everything. Uh, my last five deals, since that's an easy way to do this, um, MLS, nope, wholesaler, MLS, pocket listing, wholesaler, MLS. So two MLS, two wholesalers, and a pocket listing. That's heavy on the wholesaler side. I've only done, I think, three or four deals ever with a wholesaler. This one wholesaler is just really good. Does a good job. And I don't mind paying his fee. So that's where my last five deals are. Um, so driving for dollars, um, I've um, very few deals that way. Very few. Very few. That's going to be a big part, though, of like sub two deals and seller financing. That's going to be a big part of that. So that's something we're going to definitely have to ramp up for sure. Um, also, what's your criteria for vetting tenants? Um, so ours is um, credit score. Excuse me. Credit score. Um, rental history. Um, and now, so I have a video. Um, which is called the survival guide for landlords post COVID or survival guide for landlords. Take a look at that video. I spent about 10 or 15 minutes covering everything there, but the big, the big moving pieces are, did you pay your landlord the last three payments of your rent? Um, the, uh, background check and credit check and the credit check. I'm fine with like a credit karma. Unless, and and uh, usually for me, it's 680 credit score and higher. Um, if you're below that, I just want to know why you're below that. And some things we can make an exception for, like medical bankruptcy or medical, um, a ton of medical bills. I get it. Like 37,000 bucks worth of medical bills because you didn't have insurance. I get it. So we'll, we'll work with you on that stuff. We do, we do. Um so yeah, that's for, that's for vet. So that's what, that's what we do to vet tenants. Yep. Um, references. I mean, honestly, mm -mm, no, I've gotten, we used to do that and we got so many references that were completely untrue. They were just lies. You're just like that. There's no way that guy knows anything about that employee. Like there's just no way. The, the, the guy spoke so unbelievably highly of the person and the guy could not have been any more of a dumpster fire. There's no way that he was that good of an employee, be, employee being that big of a dumpster fire. By the way, guys, if any of this stuff has helped you at all, give me a quick thumbs up. I'd appreciate it. Ugh. Trying to grow the channel a little bit. I don't generally speaking care about the numbers, except I only more look at it like this is the number of people we've helped type of thing. So I appreciate the thumbs ups. Um, so yeah, so hopefully, hopefully Karen, hopefully that helps. Um, hip harp one silver. Thanks. You're very welcome. Yeah. My accountant gets a, gets a, a discussion point, but at the end of the day, he's only looking at the numbers and he might not have the understanding of what your full on strategy is later on. Um, so yeah, like I have one property that, the numbers are disgustingly good and a property came up next door to it where I wanted to buy it. The numbers there weren't nearly as good, but I wanted control. Um, so I was willing to pay for a deal that wasn't necessarily a great deal. It's an all right deal. It's all right. It's good. It's all right. It wasn't great. It's all right. Um, but yeah, so I will, you know, a lot of times I'll pay a premium for something next door to me for sure. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, Chester Williams at Karen Molnar. Uh, I've heard uh, there are some property management 
companies that will that vet and place tenants, um, I guess they charge a fee for that as a service. They do. They do charge a fee for that. That's why you're better off. Like, um, that's why you're better off just doing it yourself because you can pay like a, a data service company um, to pull credit um, and do a background check. You can just pay for those things yourselves. Um, and some property management so comp softwares like uh, Hemlane, they actually include that credit score and criminal, I think criminal background check. I think they include that in their software uh, or software as a service. Um, you're paying the monthly fee for their software, but, um, but that's in there as a service. So Hemlane's done a good job with that stuff. Dana from Hemlane's very smart lady. I've had, a, I've had the pleasure of speaking with her a couple of times. Very nice. Her team's very sharp. Um, that's one of the softwares that we're, we're working with currently. Uh, Chester, do the different neighborhood classes have different premiums of discounts comparable to each other? Uh, for example, an A class having a 20% premium compared to a C class. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, the only thing that I found is the percentages are unreliable. The percentages are unreliable because you're having to consider not only location, but quality of product. So you might have an A product that's C quality, but a B product or a B area that's A quality, right? So those percentages are really tough to kind of figure out. So that's where for me, it's really just based on experience. And that's why looking at Craigslist, there's always pictures of those units on Craigslist. And so if you have, if you're watching those units on Craigslist, you're able to quickly figure out, okay, this guy is all brand new, all done, you know, B class area and he's 1650. Well, I've got something B class area. I'm not all done. And so what the heck, let's throw it up there for a week for 1650, whatever he, let's say he got that 1650. That's what I would probably do. That's what I would probably do. Especially now where there's just such a huge, huge shortage of available, available rental properties. There's just a massive shortage. Um, the COVID program in my county uh, needs over 100 units. The voucher program in my community for Section 8 for one town is over 20. For another town is over 30. How many, how many do I need to win? Like, I only need one out of 150 people that are looking. My units aren't that junky. You know, my units are nice. My units are always A or B neighborhood. Um, very rarely C, but all, and not, and that's it. A, B, C, if there is a D, right? So no D. Um, a, B, or C, if there is a D, I will do an A, B, or C. I own very little in C, um, but mostly in A area, B area, um, and then A, B, and C quality in those, but the Cs we take up to Bs. That makes sense. So there's no real algorithm for that. And if there was, I would not ask Zillow for their algorithm. Clearly didn't work. Arrogant douches. Those guys. That just so annoys me. Like they think that a person can be replaced by an algorithm. It, it puts no value on what we do, which is obviously wrong. They lost. Lost huge. A half a billion Half a billion dollars. Man, that CEO should never work again. That's just a travesty. Anyway, I digress. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -ba. Don Cornell. Hey, Don. Good morning from Fremont, California. Hey, Don. Good to have you. Um, Heather McIver. Good morning. Hey, came in late, so I'll watch from the beginning after you are done today. Yep. For all of you who don't know, Heather here is here every week, religiously. It's very nice. And she's from Alaska. She's the only touch point I have to Alaska since my friends moved from Alaska. Um, I have a tenant that wants to stay in the unit and we are good with keeping them. She recently mentioned that the counter needs to be fixed. We agree and, we, and we're and we going to do it after she moved out. Okay. 
Um, we were going to replace the cabinets as well. Okay. The counter currently has multiple layers of some type of contact paper. Oof, yeah. Okay. Um, so it's peeling all over. Yep. Nasty. Yep. Is there a temporary type of fix that will replace it all or just, is there a temporary, is there any temporary fix or would you replace it all or just the counter with the tenant in? Um, so a little bit outside the box. Um, if you can live with it. Um, you can very inexpensively replace just the counters. I would not do like a Formica or anything weird or goofy like that. You're in Alaska. Beautiful, right? Trees. I would go to you. I'm sure you have a sawmill like every 50 feet. It's a joke, of course, Heather. But I would talk to them about slabs. I would talk to them about slabs. Um, get something that is doesn't have to last forever. Um, I would get uh, slabs. Um, I would get I would yeah, depending on the configuration of the kitchen, because I would then just model the kitchen uh, or template the kitchen, if you will, and then just go to them and say I need this measurement this way, this measurement this way, and I need two pieces or one piece, um, and then just measure in how big the sink bowl cut needs to be, and. Whatever that wood is, I guarantee you can jigsaw or cut it yourself or they can, you know, with a, with a table saw and then just drop in a new sink. Um, my guess is those tree wood slabs are very inexpensive up there. They're not, they're, they're decently inexpensive here. Um, but then I would just polyurethane the heck out of it. And again, I'm not talking like live edge, you know, they can rip, you know, rip saw down both sides and just basically give you a slab. And then I would just poly and resin the heck out of it. Uh, and that would be a great solution for now. And that's a solution that gets you clean. Um, and you're probably doing that with a little bit of work on your, on your own side. Um, give me just one second. Hello? Okay. Had to make sure that that was weird. Had to make sure that wasn't a tenant call. Yes, I answer my tenant calls. Um, on a Sunday at 207. It's usually not good. Um, so that's what I would do, Heather. I would definitely look at um, I would definitely look at a sawmill, try and find out what they'd charge you for a slab, you know, eight, ten foot, whatever it is. That's what I would do. That's what I would do. I mean, depending on the price, I don't know if, uh, you know, what stuff is going for up there. I don't know if you're handy at all. That's the cheapest way. Um, especially with how expensive everything is to get shipped, you know, to Alaska. Um, and man, like live off the land, man. Right. Love Alaska. It's beautiful. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So sawmills, that's what I would do. Cause around here you can get that slab for, 100, 100 bucks, maybe 150. Within two hours, I'd have that thing ready to get plopped on a counter. <clears throat> That's what I would do. I wouldn't replace the cabinets with somebody living there. Nope. That's you're looking at probably at a minimum of a two week project, and that means no kitchen for them for two weeks. They might be understanding the beginning, they will not be understanding by the end. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. So, Heather, what are your thoughts? I want your feedback. Dion, Dion Talk Financial Freedom. There he is. There he is. Smash the like button. I agree with him. He's so smart. I like Dion. I always say it every week. I like working with Dion. He's good. He's good. He's going to rehab a unit someday. I'm telling you. I know he will. He self-manages. He's definitely going to rehab a unit someday. Right. But not today. I, right here. Yeah. Knew it. No, that's exactly what you're saying. Uh, Ramirez Real Estate Team. Hey, good morning. Good to have you here. Matthew Paris. Have to catch up for the rest of the reruns on my phone. 2%. <laughs> I understand that. Great job, Jake. Hey, appreciate that. 
appreciate that. Always, always excited to sit down and hang out with you guys and chat, talk shop. <clears throat> it's a blast. Um, oh, try. I got to get some... The, Now we're good. Okay, good. Um, Mike Hackleman. Monster student loan debt. Never seen that before. Whew, yeah, get it. Sure. Um, something I'm seeing more and more of affecting credit scores as well. Have you formulated thoughts around this new class? Yep, sure do. Um, and the reason why is because um, I'd say 25% of our renters are students whether college or grad. Um, so what I look at is the other stuff. So that will absolutely affect people's rents. Yep. But I look at other stuff. I look at other stuff. Um, like credit card debt. Somebody sent me a tenant that had like a low credit score, but they had jacked up all and every credit card they had fully maxed out. I'm like, no, like they're a horrible fit. They will, they are living life so hard on the edge. If they miss three weeks worth of work or two weeks worth of work, even just getting COVID, I'd be screwed. So no, mm -mm. um, yeah, so like medical debt, kind of the same thing for student debt. It's kind of the same thing, largely speaking. Um, so yeah, I, I I take that into account. I take it into account, but I, that's why I like to, if they have a great credit score and you're over 680, then it's no questions. If you're under 680, it's like, okay, why are you under 680? Um, yeah, because I've seen somebody that literally didn't know that they had like a target bill that hadn't gotten paid. It was like $163. Everything else was perfect, but that dropped their score 100 points. Like, yeah, that tenant was okay. Everything else was paid, car payments, like the whole nine, right? So, yeah. I'm more looking at debt to income. That's what I'm more concerned about. Because as a student, um, if you are working, then usually that money is free money. So it depends on if they're like a grad student where they're just out of school, but they're getting money for uh, their education. Usually there's a housing component of that as well. So that's, you know, some of the things I just try and understand, which is, okay, you're on school loans, you know, tell me what your income from the school loans is, plus your income from your job, um, if there's something on there, because that's just part of the income statement side. So really good question, Mike. Uh, let me know if that was helpful. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Heather McIver, never thought of that. I did not want to try a full cabinet rental with them in there. I was hoping to find a quick fix and that should work. Yeah. Awesome, Heather. Very cool. Glad I could help. Um, my husband is a building maintenance guy. My dad built wood things when I was younger, so I'm pretty handy myself. Yep. I'll look into slabs this week and let you know. Yes. Awesome. So again, tons of sawmills up there. Slabs, yes. You can, if you're plenty handy yourself, I mean, we're talking, you know, dropping a circular saw blade, like, you know, mark it out in pencil, drop the blade and boom, you cut your own hole. And all you need to do is get the slab to your house. Like, really, really cheap. Um, I've done that on a couple of buildings where it was really cool. Got a nice sealer on there and then you can go resin or you can go just, you know, spray on a ton of coats of poly, um, or roll on a ton of coats of poly. Um, and in a lot of cases, that's, that's a good enough temporary fix where it's pretty, it's just, it's pretty enough. Um, and it's thick enough where it's not, you know, it's, you're, you're usually those things are like an inch and a half thick um, at least. And it's, so it's not like a piece of ply with, it's like a half inch thick and it's not sheet and layered. So you have to worry about any of that stuff. Um, if it's a more rustic apartment, leave the live edge, you know, if it's not a rustic apartment, yeah, cut that down and, you know, and then you can even put like some uh, half round on the ends to just finish it off. All that stuff, you're talking, like I said, less than 150 bucks. And it looks good. It looks good. I wouldn't do it if it looked crappy. Um, but it looks good. It looks natural. The other thing you can do, too, is you can actually sand it all. You can also paint it. That's your other option, too. Um, 
Or if you hated that idea, they actually also make uh, like stainless steel and rolls like that, the, the contact paper that you're talking about, they actually make that stuff where you can then like do it, glue, adhesive, blah, blah, blah. You can do that too. So lots of options, but that gives you a great base, inch and a half thick, that thing's not breaking. Uh, and then that covers you until you go to, you know, uh, toss, uh, toss that kitchen when that tenant leaves. So that's what I would do. Good. I, I can't wait to hear your feedback on that. Uh, Matt Herbert at the, uh, Dion fi Talk Financial Freedom. Do you have a link to an example of a binder method document? I'm inheriting two under market rents on Wednesday and, and intending to. Yes. So, guys, what Matt Herbert is speaking about is Dion Financial Talk's binder method. Spectacular. So, um, he did it. He does it. Um, he absolutely gets credit for it. Basically, essentially what he did in a more official process is what um, what I had been doing for years with understanding what the other market rents are, which is I would literally tell people, hey, you can check it out. This is what this place is going for. This is what this place is going for. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm going to be north of that. You know, this is what I'm thinking. He does a better job of that with his binder strategy, which is, Here's the other units that are, here's the other units that are around you and available. Um, here uh, here's what they're renting for. Let me know what you want for a rent increase. Love it because it puts the dry, it puts the tenant in the driver's seat. If the number is too low, you they know that you're just going to say, okay, yeah, I think we need to move on. If the number's good, then it's good. Good enough is good enough. So yeah, love it, love it, love it, love it. So good. So good. Yeah, Dion's the man. Theta Hedge Capital. How's it going, everyone? Good morning, Theta Hedge Capital. It's going really well. Um, Crimson Knight. Just missed a bunch. Fridge arrived. Yep, so much fun getting it upstairs and through 28-inch doors. Oh, F that. Yeah, that can't be expanded. Yeah, I've been doing that. Hopefully it doesn't break after a few years. Yeah. Yep. So around here in the Northeast, um, when they would do old houses and they would build our old houses – there was not a specific size door. So it's whatever the opening was and they would make it then make a door for it. Sucked. Absolutely sucks. So you will have, I've had 20 inch doors. I've had as small as 16, 12. No, 12 is the smallest door we've ever had. It's a 12 inch door. It's for a closet, but it was still a 12 inch door. That door. Oh, you carumba. That door to replace was like 400 bucks because they'd literally hand make it because there was no jig that they had set up to make that $400 stupid closet door. I was so bummed. I considered just using a piece of plywood and trimming it out, but then I was like, ah, then it doesn't match anything else in the house. So I bit the bullet. And that was when a typical door at that time was like 179 to 199 a door. Now they're like two, 249. They're way more expensive for doors now. Crazy, crazy. All right, we got about 13 minutes left before we hit that three hour mark. Um, so, any other questions, guys? I'm happy to answer any additional questions. Oh, um, something that I was going to cover with you guys um, just to share. I don't know if this is, it's not applicable to you, to, to, uh, applicable to you directly, but it is applicable to you. Housing pricing in my area the heck did it go? I had it and it's good. All right, we're gonna find this a different way. Hold on one second. found it. That was easy. Way faster that way using search. Chester Williams, how do you consider whether you should raise or keep rents the same at the end of a tenant's lease period? Um, so absolutely raise no matter what now, because all of my costs are up higher. Um, so I always have the conversation. You have to, you just have to. Um, 
I would do the binder method, binder method, look up Dion financial talk on, um, Dion financial talk, uh, financial freedom, uh, or Dion talk, financial freedom, sorry, Dion talk, financial freedom, look up, look him up on YouTube, watch his video on the binder strategy, watch that video. That's what's best for you. All right. So, um, what I wanted to share with you guys was, um, uh, rents, 2022 rents for how, from housing department in my area, uh, this year or 2022. So next year, a studio is 1,074. A one bedroom is 1201. A two bedroom is 1538. A three bedroom is 2058. And a four bedroom is 2295. That includes utilities. Um, and then for kind of, for each of those, you can take off about 15% is pretty roughly what the number is um, to figure out what it is if you don't include utilities. So 1,074, 1,201, 1,538, 2,058, and 2,295 is what the breakdown is in my area for housing. So like I've always said, that's the base. Well, that's, the, that's with utilities included. So I take the 15% off that number. That's the base that I would use, and then I would go north of that. If I find that I can't get that number for some reason, and it's not renting out for whatever reason, well, then I'll call housing and say, I've got this unit available for you. Um, I don't always start there for a number of reasons, um, because if I can get more on the market, I want to try and get more. If I'm proving that I'm not getting the type of tenant that I want, then I can always call housing and say, hey, this is the, here's one that I've not rented out yet. Let me know if you want it. Anywho. Uh, but that's what I would do. Um, let's see. Heather McIver. Uh, it seems to be a trend here too. Take closet doors out. Yep. Depending on the situation, do you like open closets or do you always put doors on? So um, I have done, I've done, so um, where it was in, where it was more, where it was like a heritage house or a heritage zoned house where, um, antique finishes or Victorian finishes mattered. I had to do the door. Um, in other cases, absolutely. I will open up, I will leave that door open, um, and then just rip it out and do a cased opening. Cased openings are cheap. Um, you're figuring, um, a typical, a typical door, right? So you figure two eight foot sticks on each side. So it's 32 feet there. And then the top one is, you know, less than four feet. So I call it four and four. So it's 40 bucks linear feet, the amount of uh, trim needed for a cased opening. And then you're, uh, you know, call it an eight footer, eight footer, and then, you know, a four, um, although they're not, none of them are that big. Um, but you're basically 14, you're 18 feet of, you know, typically one by five pine, uh, one by five pine times, you know, 18 feet, you're probably 30 bucks there. You're a buck a linear foot on the, on the trim, 40 bucks there. So you're like 70 bucks of material there. And then the time to put it in, which is probably a typical, uh, a typical finish guy can do that door in probably a little bit more than an hour. So you're probably a hundred to 110, 110 to 120. Um, yeah. So case to opening. Sure. If it fits, if it fits what I'm trying to do in the unit. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. I've done them, done, done a decent amount of them. Yep. Done a decent amount. Yep. Crimson Knight 921. So COC update. Okay, cool. I am not getting fined. The seller is perfect. They're actually being understanding and giving me time because I bought the house and I'm quickly addressing the issue. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Exactly what I would have hoped to see. Yeah. That's awesome. That's great news. Um, Nisi Ellison, how long does it take to get flooring delivered from American Flooring Corp? Um, I ordered my, cause I did a massive order, like thousands and thousands and thousands of feet. And we just aren't to that point in the project yet where we've installed all of it. I've installed a, a couple thousand, two or three thousand, uh, three or 4,000 feet. I've, it's probably what I've installed, but I ordered, I want to say like 8,000 feet. It was a lot. Um, so I'm not through all my stock yet. When I ordered it last time, it was about a week, week to 10 days in my area. 
It was a week to 10 days. So yeah, so week to 10 days. Um, Nisi is referring to American Flooring Corporation. This is, um, they don't pay for this advertisement, by the way. I'm not, they're not sponsoring me, but this is the flooring. So I found a, they make commercial grade, uh, wide plank vinyl flooring, nine inch plank. Um, and it's markedly better than what you'll find in the big box stores. And it's about a buck a foot less. And it comes with a pad installed on the back. And it's not a cheap, crappy pad either. It's a textured pad. Um, and then this one too. Um, this is their seven inch stuff. It comes in a bunch of different colors. But if you call them Marty the Flooring Guy or put in your notes when you fill out a, a supply request for samples, they'll treat you right. Lumberjack Landlord just mentioned that I sent you. Um, I'm trying to get that so I can get a special, really special pricing. So I'm trying to give them a picture of, hey, this is how many people are, are going to order product from you so we can try and get a special price. But, yes. So it's good. Sounds like my son crying out there because he didn't get his way. I can tell that cry. Um, so, yeah, so about a week. About a week. Oh, I'm sorry. Phone number on this. Sorry, guys. Uh, Marty, the flooring guy, call or text him 725-212-8610, 725-212-8610. Um, Marty, the flooring guy, he'll take care of you. My experience with him, I've had five or six phone calls with him. Um, he was great to work with. Um, I had damaged product. They took care of it in a few days. Their customer service was spectacular. Product's been great. Install was awesome. I've put it in five units now. So... Uh, thumbs up for me across the board. I always try and bring value to you guys that subscribe uh, and watch the live cast. Um, yeah, really good, really good product. Good company so far. Um, the only issue that they've had from things that I've heard from other people that have ordered from them is shipping. It's because they don't control it. They have to drop ship it. So they, they basically buy a ton of it over or manufacture it overseas, bring it to the States, put in container or put in their warehouse and then from their warehouse, it basically get, then gets drop shipped. They have a warehouse in Vegas, Florida, and Jersey, I think. Um, so it basically comes in the country, gets pushed to there, and then it ships from there. Um, their biggest issue has been the shipping company from there to your house or our houses. Um, that's been the biggest issue because they have to find a drop shipper and they want to do it for the right, for you know, with a good company. I know that the company that they did my deal with, they bent, they, uh, they screwed up. They did a bunch of damage, 10 boxes. They replaced them. They filed all the paperwork. They followed the claim. They didn't wait for any of that. They literally just said, yep, we'll get you 10 boxes out. Those showed up within a few days later. Um, so yeah, awesome, awesome experience with them. I, I just, I loved how they handled the problem. So yeah. Nisi, let me know how long you've been waiting. I'm, I'm unofficially, I'm just kind of, keeping an eye on things and just hearing what people's experience have been. I, I have another big order coming up. I don't know when we're going to place it. We're trying to get a little bit closer to uh, the project being ready just because I don't want to have to store it. I want to unload it and store it. Uh, Mike Hackleman. Yeah, bud. Great feedback. You guys bridge the gap between the Grant Cardone and the guy with six houses. Yeah. <laughs> Can't tell you how much value I've gotten. Really appreciate what you do. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate that. Here every Sunday, my man, and for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I love this. Love helping people. Um, and I, it wasn't that long ago that I had, um, you know, 10 buildings. I mean, we grew a lot in the last, like, three, four years. So it's not that long ago. I still remember it all. And we had never bought a property uh, that had more than three years ago, four years ago, three years ago, we had never bought a property that had more than 10 units. Or more than, excuse me, more than four. Ten years ago, or four, four years ago, 17, I think, yeah. So almost five years ago, we had never bought a property that had more than four units in it. And now, we since then, we've bought a six, a nine, a 12, um, another six. Yeah, six, nine, 12, yeah, yep, yep, another six, so... A six, a six, a nine, and a 12. Yeah. Yep. So I still remember all this stuff. And and 
actively today buy. I don't like buying those deals, honestly. I like buying the twos, threes, and fours. I'll buy those all day long. All day long, like breaking sticks. Um, but, but, but yeah, glad that's helpful, Mike. Appreciate that. Crimson Knight 921, but they are being picky about how the fire alarms are placed and wired. Yeah, yeah, they are. It's kind of a pain in the ass. Yep. I had done a rough inspection, got approved, then did the finish inspection and they failed me on two smokes. Why? Because they weren't in the right place. How is that possible? You did the rough inspection. Didn't care. They didn't care. I still had to move them. I had to pay to move them. New holes, get the wire over there, junction box the wire, get it over to that. Just what a huge pain in the ass. It was an extra day's worth of work, cost me almost a thousand bucks. They didn't care. And they had approved it on rough inspection. Yeah, that's not right. You did it. No accountability whatsoever. That's why I left that city. That's why I left Manchester. Might be a national, but that's why I left Manchester. So yeah, that's my take. Jess Williams, is there any order or preference with working with banks compared to other non-traditional forms of lenders like non-QM lenders? I'm concerned about banks getting nervous about lending in 2022. Um, yeah, yeah. So if you're under 10 deals, I still push all the time to work with banks. Always compare, right? Um but have spoken with and start creating relationship with non-traditional lenders. The last crash, non-QM lenders weren't around. So at least have a conversation with them, have a relationship with, with them, know who they are. They know who you are, what your plans are. Say, I'd like to talk to you about what my plans are for 2022 and 2023. And this is what we're doing. As a, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm trying to build, trying to grow. Those are the conversations you need to have now because then when a bank won't lend to you because they wouldn't lend to me in the crash, high sevens credit score, high sevens, low eights, great debt to income. This was not the beginning of the crash. This was more into the crash. Um, I couldn't get a loan. That's where Mike Zuber came up with his personal note that he would start doing with people. And I think that was a six and 20 note. So it was a 6% is what he would give you interest on your money. But then I think he also gave you 20% of the profits. Good money based on his model, expensive based on what your options are today, right? So, yeah. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Crimson Knight, uh, so yeah, Crimson Knight 2200 bucks for a four bedroom in National. Holy F. And I already told a bunch of porcupines 2050. Damn, I was off. Yeah, dude, I told you. Told you. And that's housing authority prices. It's housing authority prices. Contact the COVID group. Contact the group that was in charge of COVID for your, for your area. Blow your mind. They need units badly. They're doing emergency placement. And I tell them flat out, it's going to be expensive because it's emergency placement for you. And for me, I know likely that I'm not going to have that tenant after this year or 18 months. I'm going to have to do a turn and turns are expensive. So here's my unit. No apologies. Here's my unit. Here's what it costs. If you want it, let me know if they hit the criteria. Good. If they don't, okay. That's simple, guys. That's simple. The numbers I've seen on some of these units, ridiculous. Ridiculous. DC Ellison, got my box of samples and they are awesome. Oh, good. I'm good. I'm, I'm glad you said that. Um, yeah, like I said, this isn't a paid advertisement. So I just want to know, you know, are you having a good experience? Are you not having a good experience? I'm going to be a buyer there again very soon. So, um, but yeah. But yeah, I like I said, the product has been awesome. It stood up too. Four or five installs. I'm trying to remember if it was four or five. I just don't know if it's four or five because I don't know if we've done that last one yet. Um, one, two, three. Yeah, three, four. No, four. I four. I know. Soon to be five, and the product has stood up great. So we started installing that in July. So July, August, September, October, November. Five months is how long we've been installing it. So far, so good, guys. It's been good product. I like it. Yeah, even the 1500 Crimson is light. You know, I just got for a two bed in Dover. Prepare for your head to explode. 2500. 
Yep. So take your leave at price. If you don't like it, I'll rent it out. No problem. I'll give you a shot at the unit. Your call. Your choice. 2500 two bed. Yep. Um, Tim Belnier. Or Belnier. I'm a fan of the Lumberjacks content. Hey, appreciate that. That's awesome. Happy to have you here. Um, always want to ask a, answer a question, too. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Um, sorry, that's some inside baseball stuff. Can't say right now, but I will. Um, yeah, Crimson. Dude, 100%. The number is what the number is, my man. Number is what it is. It's a 2-1. Yeah, dude. 2500 You want it? Fine. You don't? Fine. The golden rule. He who has the gold makes the rules. It's the golden rule. And before everybody gets bent on that, it's a joke. Yep. So, George, it's a special program, bro. Uh... Lumberjack landlord at Gmail. Send me an email. I'll help you out. I'll help you out, my man. Um, Jennifer, I would never miss one of your questions, Jennifer. On repairs and rentals, do you purchase all materials and control that cost, or do you allow the contractors to, to purchase product? I do not allow contractors to purchase product. No. Mm -mm. Nope. Not today. No. Nope. I do it all on my own. All my material. Uh, Crimson, it's not. It's not. You saying it would be harder? It's not. They need units. They need units. Supply and demand, my man. They need units. I've got supply. You've got demand. Maybe we come together, and if we don't, it's okay. I'm not personally offended. My unit is what it is. I can't change its location. I can't change its condition. It is what it is. And if you would rather have that than where you are today, this is what it costs. Free market. That's what I love about real estate, free market. Um, so, yeah, so I don't allow them to buy product, Jennifer. I don't. The only time that that's an exception, the only time. So for kitchens... I buy my own cabinet handles. Yep, I'm a control freak. I buy my own cabinet handles. Um, I don't buy my own hinges because that comes with the cabinet. But the handles I buy myself, counters I buy myself, coordinate all that myself. Trim package, I'll show you guys a trim package next week that's going to blow your mind that's about 90% less expensive than buying the trim that comes with the cabinets. 90% less expensive, I will blow some doors off with that. That's my little trick um, for sure. Um, so yeah. And the only time that it is, is if like an electrician, he's like, yeah, it's a special breaker, blah, blah, blah. I just asked him what the breaker is. If he's in the field doing the work then, and is like, I have it on my truck. Okay, fine. Cause by the time I order it, have them come back, all that other stuff, I will lose money. Um, but largely speaking, I have them look at the job, tell me what they need. I order it all. I have it all ready. And then I say, when you're going to get, when you're going to get there, let me know. And I'll drop material off that morning for you to get there. That simple. Or I have one of the guys that does work for us pick it up at you know my shop and drop it off. So yeah. Um, Nisi just got samples. Yep, and waiting to see if the purchase of the house goes through before ordering it. Brilliant idea. I wouldn't order before your house closes. But that's awesome. That's really good. 
Um, yep. Crimson Knight. Yes, yes. G up 147. Yeah, 2,500 for a two-bedroom. Yep. Yep, I'm currently getting 1,200 in Rochester. Yep. Even my non-special program units are still 17 or 1,800 in Dover. Yep. Yep. I get more than that in uh, Town Next Door, which is south of you. I get more than that in Summersworth, too. 1,200 is light, <clears throat> unless it's a bad neighborhood. No judgment, of course. Uh, Theta Hedge Capital, are you setting are you setting these prices or is the amount set for the emergency code relief program? Theta Hedge, awesome question. I'm setting the price. And then just they approve it or they don't. No skin off my back. That's my price. You don't want to pay for that? Okay, cool. Free market. Free market. I'll charge what I want to, what I can charge. And if you want it, it's yours. If you don't, okay, too. Free market. I'm at 100% rented right now. All good tenants. I'll ask my PM and see if anyone is currently looking to leave. Thank you. Yep, I would look into it for sure. For sure. Um, and I don't know why they'd be looking to leave. It's not like they're going to get a better deal somewhere else. Like rents up where we are are nuts. They're nuts. They're going absolutely. My lowest increase in rents this year was 10%. My highest was 90% increase over last year. Tim Belnier, what factors should I consider for deciding what to do next? Another 20% down purchase or cash out refi for 80K on a property I own with no debt? I have less than 10 deals on a W-2 income. Um, so if I'm in your shoes, um, I do a cash out refi if it's an investment property, if I if it's an investment property that you own outright, I do a cash out refi. That's what I would do. Not knowing any of the other information, I I'm doing another. I did for if you hadn't watched the channel for the last couple of months in August, I did a massive cash out refi on eight properties, eight investment properties, and I'm doing another massive one on nine. So I will pretty much have refinanced my entire portfolio in the last 12 months. Yes, true story, true story. True story. All right, we'll see, we'll see real quick since we're over. Let me just see real quick if my little animals want to come in and say hi. See, shorts in the wintertime. Hey guys, you want to come in and say hi on the live cast real quick? Okay, you're going to go see mommy? What? Okay, careful. Come down the stairs and see daddy. Okay, you can go with mommy. That's fine. Come on, you can come in and say hi. Your brother gets to do it all the time. Come on. Okay. This is, oh, come here. This is Bryn. Wave, say hi. 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 This is Bryn. This is my baby lumberjack. How old are you? I'm a star. Here, show me how many numbers. One, two. That's right, two. She's two. She's big for two. But this is the one of my little lumberjacks. Ow. Okay, you want to go play? Yeah. All right, say bye. 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 <laughs> That's a very pretty dress you're wearing today. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty dress. It's a pretty dress. All right, do you want to leave my office and close the door? Yeah. That's wonderful. I love you. Bless you, Daddy. Love you, big brain. Bye, honey. See you in a bit. Yeah. So that's the little lumberjack family. <clears throat> that is my middle child, Bryn. So I always like to, the kids love to see dad on TV. So later I'll replay and I'll just show them the few minutes that they were, um, that they were on. Then they're like, that's me on TV. So, cause we watch it on our uh, TV in our living room. Um, all right. If there aren't any other questions, I am going to cut out. But if you guys have any other questions, I'm happy to answer the last couple. 
And thank you to Mika, Ryan, and Heather. I'm, yeah, I have cute kids. They look, they look like my wife. Thank God. Actually, my daughter kind of looks like me. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, did you give a baby on an update? Yes, I did. Yep, I did in the beginning. So you won't miss it. I did give an update in the beginning. She's doing great. Um, baby Bean. In fact, let me just check. I might even, there might, she might even be just outside. Check and see if the bean's there. So, um, yeah. So, uh, oh, real quickly, if you didn't watch the video on coin op laundry, please watch that video. That's something you guys, I want to make sure this is something that I don't do really do a whole lot of, but the amount of money is ridiculous. The amount of money is ridiculous. Um, all right. It's to the point where I literally don't count it. I weigh it. I weigh money. I think I might get a t-shirt that says that. I weigh money. <laughs> I, might, I might get a t-shirt that says I weigh money. It's awesome. I figured out what a, so a quarter weighs 5.67 grams. Um, there are 453 grams in a pound. That means that there are 79.99 quarters in a pound i.e. Um, so i.e. a pound of quarters is 20 bucks, 80 quarters, 20 bucks. So a pound of quarters is 20 bucks. So now literally when I get bags in, I don't count them. I weigh them. And then I write the marker on them and say, this is this many pounds equals this many dollars. It's that simple. Just divide it by the 5.67. And then I know exactly what my number is. So yeah, I, I literally weigh, I weigh my, uh, I weigh my change. <laughs> Such a nerd sometimes, but it's fun. So yeah, so keep that in mind. A pound of quarters is 20 bucks. 5.67 grams. Math you won't find anywhere else because I'm just weird. Um, but yeah, cool nonetheless. Cool nonetheless. So this week is going to be a very fun week. Watch and stay tuned. So Three Amigos group on... Um, on Facebook, if you haven't asked to become a member, please ask to become a member. Um, so totally cool. Chester, you're a finance guy. Like how cool is that, right? Math. I love it. I'm weighing stuff now. Um, so yeah, really cool. And so real quickly, yep, you're going to be on camera. <laughs> real quickly, this is Mrs. Lumberjack. So all you guys always ask about Mrs. Lumberjack. This is Mrs. Lumberjack. This is Ashley. Hi. And she'll be doing a, yeah, one pound a quarter is 20 bucks. Yep. Yep. Finance guy, Chester, thinks that's a good idea. I love it. My wife was like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm literally figuring out how much a quarter weighs. <laughs> She's like, why? I said, I need to know how much we have and the kids aren't old enough to count them. My, my daughter counts one, two, seven. So she will not be doing the books. If we needed numbers bad like that, we could use our old accountant. She is two and a half. <laughs> yeah, she's two and a half. But anyway, not, I digress. So this is my wife, Ashley. She's Mrs. Lumberjack. And she can do almost anything I can do. Um, because we taught her how to do all those things when we first got married. And she realized what being a landlord's wife was going to be because I had properties before I got married. But the reason I wanted to bring her in was because you guys are always so nice and have... Um, been praying for us as a family, praying for our daughter. Um, and Ashley is the one that sadly has to be the one doing most of the time in the hospital. I'm home with the other two. Um, so Ashley does a lot of that time going to the hospital herself. Um, and then I just keep on texting her. What's the report? What's the update? I'm waiting for the update. Um, so yeah, all the time. It's true. Um, but wanted to give you guys a chance to meet her. Um, she is going to be on Mike's channel this week. We or this week or next. We're picking a time. Um, which one of you is trying to get in? Come on in. We're on a live cast. You can say hi. Um, so she's going to be on Mike's. Oh yeah. You want to say hi again? Okay. So, so... It was, it was, it was in a blanket. Yeah, in a blanket. Oh, you found Elsa. found Elsa. Oh, thank heavens. Okay. So Ashley will be on Mike's channel this week. Um, and she will be answering questions, things like that. The whole nine yards that Mike has. So, Stay tuned for that awesome video. 
Um, she's on there first. And then we're actually working on a tandem thing. He asked, and I was like, it's actually really funny timing. I was going to bring her on the live stream this week. Um, and then we're going to start doing like a husband and wife segment. Um, so that way, if you are a husband with a wife that's not on board or a wife with a husband not on board, you guys can ask questions of both of us. Um, that will probably be a night stream is my guess. Um, seeing as how, <laughs> seeing as how we've got two out of the three are up right now, but the other one is sleeping. So, um, but yeah, thank you guys very much for uh, watching. We love doing this. She's the one watching the kids while I'm doing this for three hours on Sunday. Um, which is obviously not a problem because we're our kids. So it kind of works out. Um, but this is, and this is Samuel. Say hi, Samuel. Yeah. That's Samuel. He was the first baby lumberjack. So um, appreciate all you guys very much. Um, love doing this with you on Sundays and um, appreciate all your prayers. Um, Eliana's doing awesome. Um, she goes in for another round of chemo. Hey, you. Hey, you. Hi. <laughs> Somebody was having too much fun on the on the antique chair. Okay, that's awesome. Hey guys, take it easy. So we are gonna so we're getting ready for nap time, I think. Okay, bye guys. Bye. Love you. See you in a little bit. See you in a little bit. Um, so that's the crew. Um, so JPF three beautiful family. Thank you very much. But yeah, we're super blessed. You know, we just we uh we we we'll, we are very blessed. We have a great life, um, and it certainly wasn't without sacrifice and a lot of hard work. But um, we're making through with Eliana. Eliana's doing great. The kids are like, I want to shut the door. No, I want to shut the door. Um, so yes, yeah. So Ashley's awesome. You see, she's very tolerant. She was like. She's not like, I have to go put makeup on before I'm on camera. Awesome. She's the best. So good. Um, so, yeah, that's basically it. Here's Elsa. Oh, here we go. There's Elsa. Um, actually, I probably should get that out of frame so I don't have to pay some sort of royalty. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're just super blessed. Great. I have a great family. We're very blessed to have the family that we have. And uh, all of your prayers and thoughts are great. Um, I know that Ashley, a lot of times, so Eliana will go in for a five-day treatment. Ashley will actually go in um, for that five days. And she's the only caretaker for Eliana the five days that she's in because I'm here with the other two. Um, and so a lot of times when she gets breaks, she'll plug in her earbuds and she'll watch live streams or she'll watch some of our sessions just to kind of keep, keep up with what's going on. Um, because at three in the morning, I'll talk to her if she wants to talk, but if it's about real estate, she's going to have to just listen to the live stream. So, um, so yeah, uh, blessed to have all you guys. Hope you guys have an awesome week. Um, come with questions. So Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, I'm still going to do mics. Uh, we're trying to figure out when we're going to record that probably late Monday night. Um, but I'll still do uh, one rental at a time. Uh, three amigos on Thursday, Facebook group on uh, for the three amigos of FI, which is financial independence, reach out, make sure we'll make sure to get you guys. Um, we'll make sure to turn that around for you guys quickly, get you in the group so you can participate and have some fun with us um, in that group. And there's posing questions. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a lot of fun in that group. We have a, we have a really good time. Um, and I think, and then Friday, and then Friday, a session uh, session with Mike again, some other things we're going to cover. Um, big week this week, seeing what kind of happens with the market, with the new COVID variant. Um, as I said in the beginning of the show, I think it's going to be something that impacts us this winter for sure. Um, but do your homework, do your homework, do your homework, work your spreadsheets, work your plan, be very deliberate and intentional about this stuff. Um, you guys have seen my family, you guys know that I have a W-2 job, plus I do all this real estate stuff. Guys, you have time. Make the time. Invest in yourselves. Invest in your future. Invest in your family's future. It's well worth it. And uh, like I said, whether you're working on your first one or working on your 20th, there's absolutely something you can always learn. And more importantly, there's work that you always need to be doing to get better at the game. So appreciate all you guys. Hope you guys all have a great week. Um, that's the schedule for this week as far as showings. And then we will announce that... Um, we will announce the actual date that we're going to do the live stream. I don't think it's going to be consistent in the very beginning just because because of uh, Eliana's schedule. Um, but we'll do it, try and do it at least once a month where we just get on there and kind of answer people's questions 
and get people's feedback. Um, if you couldn't tell, Ashley's the nice one. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm interested to see what she says because I don't control what she says. So I'm very interested to see what she says about when we start doing this together. Anyway, guys, have a great week. Appreciate y'all. Um, God bless. Take care, guys.